everybody to sorry microphone welcome everybody to our february 15th work session hope everybody had a wonderful valentine's day weekend um nikki would you please lead us in the pledge of allegiance absolutely mayor i pledge allegiance to the flag of the united states of america and to the republic for which it stands one nation under god indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, we are missing uh, Commissioner Gao this morning. He is in Tallahassee um, as his role as our PSTA liaison. So he's, he's up there fighting for the good fight of transportation and transit in Pinellas County. So we wish him well, but can I, we couldn't remember whether we did the motion or not. So can I take a motion? I'll make the motion. Second. Okay, Vice Mayor and Commissioner Franey. For an excused absence. For an excused absence. Yeah. Clear. <laughs> yeah. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes four to zero. Thank you. And next, I will turn the presentation of uh, Peace Poll Month proclamation over to Commissioner Franey. Okay, and I'm not sure who's going to be coming up to receive it. You can all come up. Everybody can come. He does. <laughs> okay. Peace Day in Dunedin. Whereas the Peace Poll Project began as a global initiative in 1955 by Japanese teacher, poet, and philosopher Mahisha Goy following the devastation caused by World War II and the atomic bombs dropped on his country. And whereas the message, may peace prevail on earth, came to Goy in a moment of prayer and inspiration, words that have the power to shape our world, bringing peace and harmony to our personal lives and our beautiful planet. And whereas peace polls inscribed with this message began to appear across Japan and then spread by means of the Peace Poll Project, making its way to the United States in 1986, quote, the year of international peace, unquote. And whereas Rotary International, founded on February 23, 1905, is the world's first and one of the largest nonprofit service organizations that focuses on the promotion of peace and goodwill throughout the world. And Rotarians believe that when people work to create peace in their communities, change can have a global effect. And whereas the Rotary Clubs of Dunedin, Dunedin North, and Dunedin Waterside wanted a way to unite people together to inspire, awaken, and uplift the human consciousness in our community and agreed to plant a peace pole in Dunedin. And whereas the three Rotary Clubs titled their peace pole, Imagine Peace, to honor the first female president of Rotary International, Jennifer Jones, who chose Imagine Rotary as her presidential theme for 2022-2023. And whereas the Dunedin Community Center at Highlander Park overlooking the pond was chosen as the perfect spot in Dunedin to stand as a silent vigil for people to sit and reflect, bringing peace inside each one of us. We are all a part of this community, our country, and world. Now, therefore, I, Maureen Mofraney, by virtue of the authority vested in me by Mayor Julie ward bajowski of the city of Dunedin, Florida, and on behalf of the entire city commission, do hereby proclaim that February 23, 2022, be recognized as Peace Day in Dunedin and encourage all citizens to have peace be ever present in our words, our thoughts, and our actions. Great message. Such a good one. Got to say a few words. Great. Can we get a picture of both of them? That would be oh, good. She'll, yes. she'll do it. That would be great. I just want to say thank you from the three Rotary Clubs of Dunedin, which represents the Rotary Club of Dunedin, the Rotary Club North, and the Rotary Club Waterside. All three of these clubs came together to support this project to move forward. It's been going on for over a year to finally get to this place. 
But thank you, Mayor, Commissioners, the City of Dunedin, for supporting this project and recognizing it. I think the location of where the Peace Pole was put on the north side of the community center was just an, a, an excellent location, and it came out very well. It's a beautiful spot. It's quiet. A place where people can sit and reflect, for those who uh, recognize what the Peace Pole is all about. But uh, I'd like to thank you again for the proclamation, and I hope you all can join us next Wednesday. Thank you. Very thank good. you very much. Certainly a great message, uh, especially now with some of the divisiveness, so it's great. Thank you. Very good. Okay, uh, we have citizen input. Now is the time to, for anyone wishing to come forward and speak to any item that is not already on the agenda. If it's on the agenda, you'll have the opportunity when the uh, item comes forward, but if there are things that you want to express your feelings about otherwise, please feel free to come forward, give us your name and address for the record, and there's a clock above my head. Anyone? Any takers? Mm. Okay, come back to the commission. Um, before we get started, I just want let, to let everybody know that we have um, at least three commission discussion items, um, as well as a little bit of an update from our city manager and, um, and our city clerk. So I am going to try and wrangle this meeting to, to be completed by noon so that we have enough time to cover all those things. Okay. And you know I have a hard stop. Yep, I do. All right, so we have the consent agenda, boards and committee appointments for the causeway, code enforcement, um, code compliance, uh, Edgewater Drive, Hammock, Library, and then we have um, the construction administration services for lift station at the wastewater treatment plant. Any items to be pulled? Nope. Nope. Okay, can I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Okay, Commissioner Franey and Vice Mayor Kynes, thank you. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes four to zero. We'll move on to our action items. We have resolution 2206, first quarter budget amendment. Nikki, can you read that resolution by title only? Resolution 2206, a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Dunedin, Florida, amending the city's operating and capital budgets for the fiscal year beginning October 1, 2021, and ending September 30th, 2022, and providing for an effective date. This has been reading of Resolution 2206 by title only. Thank you. Can I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Commissioner Franey and Vice Mayor Kynes. Thank you. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. I'm the finance director, and I'm here with Ashley Kempton, our budget manager. Uh, this item uh, is resolution 2206, is amending the fiscal year 2022 operating and capital budget. The total budget amendment in the staff room report is an increase in appropriations of 23.9 million in various funds in fiscal year 22. The purpose of the carry forward budget amendment uh, are to appropriate carry forward encumbrances and project budgets from fiscal year 21 into fiscal year 22. The outstanding encumbrances result when purchase orders have been created during the fiscal year, but the goods and services have not been invoiced or shipped by September 30th, 2021. Uh, at the end of the fiscal year, encumbrances and the funds <clears throat> that have been budgeted in the prior year are carried forward into the next fiscal year through a budget amendment. The encumbered items to be carried forward uh, from 21 to 22 total $4,912,000. Uh, the detail list is in attachment C in the staffing report. And the other carry forward amounts are for project budgets that are not completed as of September 30th, 2021, and they total $19,030,000. The detailed list of projects is in attachment D in the staffing report. The impact on each fund, uh, each, each fund balance by fund, is shown on page one of the background section of the staffing report in attachment A. This shows the affected funds and the total impact of their respective fund balances. And also want to mention that. Uh, all funds, are, all funds are meeting or exceeding their reserve level targets with the exception of the CRA fund. Uh, this is shown in attachment E, and this is the last attachment and page in the staffing report. The CRA estimated available fund balance uh, at the end of 2022 is uh, 52, 52, well, $5,294. Uh, that's under the reserve goal of 15%. But I want to mention that the CRA budget in 2022, when we adopted the budget, we knew, we knew it was uh, going to be 
a fairly tight cash flow year and the budget was actually adopted at it being $6,200. So we're not surprised by this, but staff will continue to monitor the CRA funds throughout 2022 uh, to make sure we pay attention to the cash flow. Um, th that concludes the general comments and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, questions for Les. Vice Mayor, any questions? Oh, I forgot who I was. <laughs> <laughs> How often does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm just, I'm totally teasing. Um, actually, no, I mean, I looked this over very carefully and there's like 20 million is for penny, waste, water, wastewater, which the penny is 10, that's for the building. Water wastewater is seven million, and then stormwater is three million. So that's almost twenty million of the entire um, catalog. So I have no issues. Any questions on this end? I mean, uh, no. I mean, Jennifer and I had our meeting, and I think I had all my questions answered. I'm good. Okay, Commissioner. I can Palmer? say the same then too for brevity. Okay. Um, anyone from the public wish to come forward and speak to this item? All right, we'll come back uh, to the commission. Any final comments from anyone? Um, just say, I mean, there's no surprises here. This is all carry forward, and so these are things that we are we know about. So, okay, it. very good, great job, and it was pretty condensed, yeah, I thought. So thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Toronga. Aye. Vice Mayor Kynes. Aye. Commissioner Franey. Aye. Mayor Bajowski. Aye, and that motion passes four to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Good job. <laughs> That's right. All right, then we have, um, I see Robert on the line. We have the uh, Mies Hospital parking lease agreement. Um, Bob. Okay. Welcome. Jeannie Garner will be doing the presentation this oh, morning. And Bob will good be morning. Good morning, Jeannie sorry. Garner with uh, Economic Development. Uh, we'll be bringing two leases forward this morning uh, with Mies Hospital. Um, one is for the Mies Materials site, and the other is for the Virginia-Milwaukee parking lot. The Virginia-Milwaukee parking lot is just an extension to that lease for another uh, year and a half now, for October 2023. The Mies Materials lot um, is, we're looking to do a long-term lease. I'm trying to get the PowerPoint up here, pardon me. So this is the site, as you see, the Mies Materials site and then the um, Milwaukee, Virginia Street. So the Mies Materials site, we're looking to do some improvements to uh, expand the parking there. So the CRA is looking to make an investment there of nearly $200,000 to improve that site. So um, you'll see the deal structure here. So uh, it'll add additional parking. Part of the project includes demo in the building, um, doing construction site work there and paving and striping and then doing some finishing work to make the property look attractive. So um, that will increase the parking stock there to 56 parking spaces. So what you needed parking down in the downtown area. The timeline for the project, you will see, well, here's the parking site uh, um, Janie, layout. Let me just, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt. What we're seeing on the screen is Bob and not your, Okay. not your, uh, Love you, Bob, but we'd rather see <laughs> Yeah, there we go. There we, no, we're good there. We, we, we have it back now. No, you had it. You, you were good. It's, it's back where it should be. Okay. Well, now it oh, isn't. No, it's nice. Yeah, there it is. There. Are we good? Okay, yep. there we go. So here's the site layout that we have proposed that will give us the 56 extra parking spaces. So as you see, it includes the demo of the building and then um, some of the site work. And then, of course, we'll make it very attractive uh, when, when it's finished. The proposed uh, timeline for the project is we um, immediately we'd like to get structure engineering out there to uh, make sure that the, that the, the space is uh, secure and then they can uh, uh, finish the design work. Then we'll move into the demolition this summer, the construction, paving and striping, and we hope to have the project finished by October 2022 this year. So um, as I said, uh, Bob Ironsmith is on the call and Trevor Davis is also here to answer any questions you may have. Okie doke. Any questions on the lease agreement? No. No. 
Questions? I Questions? I did. Um, I actually asked Jennifer about the clawback provision. She explained it. Okay. Mm. Um, I do have a question, and I did speak to Jennifer about this ahead of time. Um, it's not relating to the lease, but it's the only time we'll have the chance to, to uh, ask the question, so I didn't have a choice. Um, so for anybody, I don't know who's going to answer it, but as you know, we've had some issues with closing our street to Milwaukee and not having access to the parking and to some of the buildings. And so I, we kind of talked about this in a previous meeting, if we might be able to create some back access to that. I don't know if it's a good idea or not, but I think we were talking about looking at that. So I didn't see it on this picture, which is why I'm asking. Or Mayor, if, if I may, uh, Jennifer did speak to me. I've talked to uh, Public Works Director Paul Stanick. Uh, we are doing a comprehensive review of it. It is very challenging because of grade, drainage, and width there. But uh, Paul is certainly aware. I know he's probably in the audience there, and uh, we are taking uh, a look at it. And then, okay, of course, he's, the funding. he's sitting here, okay. ready to talk. Yep. Uh, Paul and I had a couple of talks in uh, engineering, which uh, I want to give some kudos to engineering for doing the design. So thank you, Russell and, and Patrick and Andy. Um, they've been working very closely with us and uh, they're going to take a look at this too. And it could be a situation where obviously it's private property. There would need to be an easement attained. Uh, but the Boy Scouts have always, as you know, Mayor, been a good partner with us. And perhaps it's a different type of surface. So uh, Public Works is going to take a close look at it frankly, and that's where, where we are today. Thank you, Bob. Paul, did you have anything you wanted to? I, I pretty much think Bob has, has said it all. Um, he, he is right with it being private property, and so we would have to uh, work through that. And, and also, too, it, it seems like that parking lot is being used a lot for the staging for the different events, so we would have to, to look at, you know, how it's going to be used, when it's going to be used, those kind of things. So. Yeah, and for me, I mean, I'm not so worried about it today. I'm worried about it, access to it in the future, because, you know, we have this whole East End redevelopment plan, right? And, you know, eventually there will likely be more active business turnover in this area, you know? Um, and so access to that parking, when the gateway is built, it's likely we will want more closings all the way to Milwaukee. In the future, I'm not talking about today. And so if that's going to kind of transition itself naturally, then I want to make sure we're thinking about it today while we're spending the money to do engineering and, and parking and all that, you know, sure. access. So. Yep. Absolutely, we'll look at that. Can I just... Sure. Um, so the access points now are, it's the Boy Scout property? What are the... Because the there's two ways to come into that, right? I mean, there's the main, off main and... Yeah, off main off, and then off, off of Loudoun. Um, right there. So th that's the, the two access points. Um, off of Main is just the, that little front part of the parking, and then off of um, Loudoun is the, is the rest of the parking. We're obviously looking to take down the building, but we're going to end up, because of the elevation changes there, we're going to be um, leaving some of that as is um, based on when we do the structural analysis of, of what's there and, and what we can use and, and stem walls and things. Once again, it's great having the elevation, but when you're trying to do a surface parking lot that's going to be ADA compatible, that makes it so much more difficult. So, and then along the, the backside, the Scottish American Society between them and the Boy Scouts, there is kind of a little dirt road that, that goes from Milwaukee, and I won't want a path, I won't even call it a road, and, and I guess that is what we're, we're speaking about, but it, it's unimproved. Um, it, it provides access, uh, I believe, for the homeowner that, that lives off of Loudoun back oh, okay. in there. Okay, so it's actually a private homes. Who yeah, owns there's, well, there, yeah, there's, it's either a single-family home or a duplex uh, off of Loudoun that ends up getting closed off as well. But if, if you look at the different closures throughout um, the, the length of, of Main Street, there, there's a number of places that are affected in that same way. So for me, I, I mean, I don't even know if it's a good idea. Yeah. no, I, I have no idea. I'm not saying it is or, or not. We haven't communicated with people well, over there. You know, we don't know once Gateway well, is built whether there will be all of a sudden this influx of traffic that gets stuck because they can't, you know, there's all kinds of things we have to consider, but I just want to make sure we're considering it all at the same time while we're spending money. I just feel like it's efficient. Mayor, we'll, Mayor, we'll take a close look at it with, with Public Works and Engineering. And I, 
I, I just want to say just two things. Kudos to engineering for its design, but to be honest with you, a big thankful, thankful, uh, thank you to uh, Baycare. They always working with us. Anytime we call on them, they step up to the plate. And this is just another instance. And I'm very proud of the stockade fence that came down and the improvements that, that are there. It opened up the Scotch. It opened up everything in that area. So I think it was a really uh, a promising thing to work with Baycare. Okay. Thank you. Um, anyone wish? Did I already do this part? Anyone wish to come forward and speak to this item? Everybody good? All right. Um, any final comments? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I do. I mean, I think uh, it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure we're, you know, reaching out and thanking um, our partner, Mies Hospital. Um, I mean, pretty amazing, really, when you look at what they're willing to do. Um, I know they won't sell the property. I under fully understand that. That's been vetted. But really, to go into these kind of partnerships in different areas of their available parking at off times is a uh, is a great partnership. I mean, they are a community hospital, but they don't have to do this, and it's great. We should yeah. we should uh, thank them often. Mm -hmm. So, thank you, Commissioner, and, and thank you to Nikki Day for putting this stuff together for us too. I appreciate that. Um, Mrs. Mayor, yes, um, I just like to say that we have a long history of public-private partnerships, and Baycare has partnered with us before, and has been an excellent partner. Mies, um, so. Again, public-private can really come in in a very interesting niche to get things accomplished when you couldn't otherwise. So again, we we all thank them. I'll, I'll go along with that. I'll make the comment that this is actually we're talking about two leases here, mm -hmm. and and the one is just incredible on in Milwaukee and uh, in Virginia, uh, and that's just been fan they've been fantastic about that as well as the overflow parking uh, behind them. So. They've been with us for, for a number of years now, probably six years on that. And so this is, this is a, a good plan, a good, a good program, and much needed. And so I'm in full support of it. Thank you. As am I. I do need to take a motion to approve this. So moved. Okay. Second. Okay, Vice Mayor and Commissioner Twonga. Thank you. Um, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes four to zero. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you. Thank you to Jeannie for stepping up here, thank too. You, Appreciate it. Thank you, Jeannie. And Trevor. Thank you, Paul. And Trevor. Paul. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Now we have the uh, sub-agreement with FDEM um, and the City of Dunedin for Hazard Mitigation Grant program for lift station number 20. And Russell? that was the shortcut. Oh, I, that was what I was trying to do. I was trying to figure out how do I shorten it and still say what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> Go ahead. All you guys. Yeah. Russell, All you right. got this. Well, good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. I'm Russell Ferlita, Assistant Public Works and Utilities Director and City Engineer. And here I'm, I'm here to talk about the subrecipient agreement between the State of Florida Division of Emergency Management and the City of Dunedin for a HMGP grant for Lift Station 20 Rehabilitation. So this program is a federally funded program. Uh, it's administered by the FDEM uh, to assist local governments in implementation of funding uh, following long-term uh, measures for disaster mitigation. Um, this particular project was funded from the uh, HMGP grant uh, release from IRMA. The city uh, submitted two separate projects, the List Station 32 funding grant and the List Station 20 funding grant. List Station 32 was previously approved, and we brought that to you previously. It is currently awaiting transfer by FEMA from uh, design to construction. And then this is the List Station 20 grant. Um, the funds for this project were budgeted in fiscal year 22 out of the water sewer fund under project number 522002. Uh, by entering this subrecipient agreement, uh, which has been reviewed by the city attorney, the city is eligible to be reimbursed for construction expenses in an amount up to $997,757.38 and total grant funding. Uh, the total project cost is estimated to be about $1.3 million. So it's about a 75% um, match, basically. 
Uh, staff hereby recommends the execution of the subrecipient agreement with FDM for the HMGP grant for lift station 20 rehab project as detailed previously. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Okay, any questions? No, okay. all good news. Just a comment. Yeah, just okay. a comment. Uh, any, any input from the public? All right, uh, can I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Whatever. Okay. Whatever. <coughs> Commissioner Franey and Vice Mayor Kynes, any final comments? Uh, well, I mean, it's all good news in the sense that, uh, you know, we're receiving money and on something that's really important uh, in terms of rebuilding and rehabbing. So uh, um, thanks for all your work to make it happen. And, uh, yeah, let's go. Very good. Um, I'd just like to comment that in the last two times, we've seen public-private partnerships and the power of grants. Mm -hmm. So those are two tools that have really, that really always work in our governmental structure. And uh, I'm very appreciative of 75% grant from the Florida Department of Emergency Management. Very good. Anything, Commissioner? No, so I appreciate the the, uh, the entire project here, both of them, both of them, and uh, and, I, and again, I love the grants. So when when it's available, it's made available for people and for organizations like us that that suffer something, and, and we did, and so we you know, staff has followed up on it. So it was fantastic, great job. Very good, thank you, gentlemen. Great job, really appreciate it. I know Jennifer's happy. And proud. You can look at the pride on her face Always. over there. <laughs> I can see brief it. Brief and brilliant, too. There you go. All right. You know, if I could say, if we keep being so brief and brilliant, Jeff is going to look like the guy that's the... <laughs> no. It's all his fault. Yeah. It's all his fault. No. There you go. Okay. Um, all in favor, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Four to zero. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. And then we have the addendum to city man to the city manager's employment agreement. Are we communicating with both of you ladies this morning, or how are we doing this? Like Teresa, Teresa, Teresa. Teresa. Gotcha. Bring the item, and then um, we're just getting your um, Labor and Employment Council, David Miller, will be on the line as well in case the commission has any questions. Okay. Go ahead. Good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commission. Uh, Teresa Smalling, Director of HR and Risk Management for the city. I bring before you uh, an amendment, a proposed amendment to Jennifer's employment agreement. You may remember on June 26, 2017, the Commission selected Jennifer as the, as the Needham City Manager and her negotiated employment agreement, which is in the packet, at the time uh, awarded her a lump sum of her annual leave on her anniversary date, which is August 28th. The agreement also stated that uh, her she would uh, be under the same rules and policies as general employees. And in uh, the employee ESSR, or the Employee Service System Rules, it basically says that uh, no employee shall carry more than 200 hours over to the next uh, fiscal year. So this created a problem for Jennifer. As you know, she's very dedicated. She doesn't always get to use those 200 hours throughout the course of the year. So uh, she would have a remnant left, and then on August 28th, she would then have that extra 200, which would then put her losing um, hours each year. Uh, with this in mind, uh, she and I met with our uh, city attorney, Nikki Day, and her law partner, David Miller, who is board certified in the Florida Bar in Labor and Employment Law. And uh, after talking with, with them and, and kind of laying out the issues, uh, David came up with the language that you now see in the addendum. Basically, it says that effective September 30th of 2021, we are recommending that the contract, her employment agreement, be amended to allow her to carry over a maximum of 200 hours of annual leave each fiscal year, consistent with city employees. And we're also uh, recommending that uh, her, anniversary, her, her date that she receives her annual leave be moved to October 1st of each year. So therefore, we won't run into that 
issue of her having, you know, almost 400 hours in any one moment. So uh, her, her accruals would be capped at 400 hours. Uh, should she leave employment with the city, the most that she would be able to, uh, eligible annual hours that she would be paid out would be 200 hours. So at this time, uh, David is here, Nikki is here, and I am here to answer any questions you may have. Okay. Um, and we did get David up on, on your big screen, David. So now everyone can sort of see you. You're this floating head in the sky. <laughs> Welcome, David. Uh, Jennifer, did you have anything to add? Uh, no, I don't, Mayor. Okay. All right. Questions for any of the above? Just, uh, yes, I do. Uh -huh. So um, she has the cap of 400, but only 200 hours can be carried over per year. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Question? No, I mean I get it. I mean you 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 get a new pot of by contract on October first. Um, on no, you get it on September thirtieth, and then October first, you can't have more than two hundred. So I get it. It's a it's a I think it's a flaw in the contract. Um, I read it thoroughly and it seems to take care of it. Uh, it. Makes sense. I think it's reasonable. You'll never get paid off for more than two hundred. So that kind of clears that up. So I think this is a good solution. Unless we, don't, unless we just don't want her here in the month of September. <laughs> well, <laughs> good negotiation, though, I will say. When I read, read the budget, <laughs> yeah. we are adopting a budget in September. But. <laughs> Commissioner, yeah. Torn, got any questions? No, I, I feel like this is congruent with the, with the employees, so um, I, didn't yeah. have, I didn't have any issues about it after having read it thoroughly and, and discussing it as well with Jennifer. Any public comment on this? Yes, right. <laughs> yeah, good point. Us too. <laughs> um, okay, can I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Okay, Commissioner Franey and Vice Mayor Kynes, any final comments no. from anybody? Happy to assist. Thank you so much. Thank You're very welcome. Much appreciate Thank you, Teresa. Here. All right, uh, all in favor signify by... <laughs> All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes four to zero. Bye. Thank you, David. Thank you, mm -hmm. David. Thanks, Thank David. You, um, where am I at? Okay. All right. Proposed agenda for our March 8th meeting. Um, we have a couple of consent items. One of the consent items is the PSTA redeployment of the autonomous vehicle and I'd like to pull that off a of consent I agree because I think we're gonna oh, yeah we, we're gonna and I think we need that. to ask PSTA to do it a presentation on what the issues had been because if we don't everybody's gonna be asking correct and we've determined it's their story to tell but they need to actually tell it very good mayor uh, so we'll put that under action items um, and then everything else to me I mean, we've, we don't have any workshop items or informational items, and some of these are going to be the longer, you know, the furniture for City Hall might be a discussion. The um, um, FCT grant agreement for Gladys Douglas will definitely be a discussion, so, but I think it'll be okay. So everybody okay with that adjustment? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okie doke. Uh, can I have a motion to approve with, with that change? So moved. Second. Okay, Vice Mayor and Commissioner <laughs> Tornga. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 4 to 0. Thank you. Um, okay, so now we have um, the Dunedin Energy Report, which we uh, kind of put in <clears throat> into our staff and uh, Commissioner Franey's hands to to work on on our behalf. Um, so I'll look to Commissioner Franey if you have any opening remarks that you wanna make before we have the presentation. Yeah, I do. Um, actually, um, thank you all from Duke for being here. Um, <clears throat> back, I think, in, uh, you had it as May 2021, I didn't remember, but um, obviously this has been an ongoing issue since some of the storms that we'd had over the years and some issues that we'd had with Duke Energy. Um, you know, I um, obviously, felt like, I know I was a little irritating about some of the past reports that had been done when I was actually a staff person back in the early 2000s. 
Um, uh, but anyway, I appreciated that the commission let me kind of take the ball with staff. Jorge's been awesome. Uh, and, um, and just kind of try to, to get the kind of report I thought the commission should get. Um, and I, um, and really I'm very happy about it. I know that uh, Chris particularly, he's repeated my words. I didn't want a dog and pony show. I wanted something that's personalized for Dunedin. And, um, and I think that that's been something that personally I've actually never seen um, from any of the energy companies. And, but I'm happy to say that I think we really got that and we're gonna hear that today. I, obviously you all will have your own questions. Um, you know, they may be, you know, some, some very pointed questions that we want to ask Duke, but I will say from my perspective, they've worked hard to try to personalize this, and, uh, and so I look forward for you all to hear it and uh, be able to ask some questions. Um, I know that uh, from the staff side, Jorge, Keith, and Will, I think, have been our main players and, yeah. and, and did an awesome job on that side. Uh, <clears throat> Chris has been the main player, as well as Mike and Jeff, but Chris has been kind of our lead contact, and... And actually, I, I, I say that Chris has been the guy that kind of got it, you know, like how to, how to make it more personalized. So um, we, uh, I'm going to let Jorge, if you want to say a couple words. I know we also have our franchise agreement ending in July, and there may be some things that we want to push that, that's important to us uh, today. So, uh, but Jorge. Okay, great. Good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, uh, morning. Commissioners. Um, you know, Commissioner Franey, uh, you know, hit the nail on the head. As far as, as the presentation this morning, um, as she mentioned, we've been working with uh, Duke. We've had multiple meetings since May of, of last year when the commission um, directed staff to coordinate with Commissioner Franey, obviously, you know, given her past experience on the staff side uh, during the previous uh, negotiations related to the, the past franchise uh, agreement renewal at that time with uh, Florida Power slash Progress Energy. So, uh, as I mentioned, since May of uh, 2021, we've met with uh, Chris and, and Jeff and Mike and several others from Duke um, on a regular basis to try to address the concerns that were raised uh, during uh, some previously commissioned city reports that were conducted back in 2001 and 2003. Um, you know, uh, that's part of your agenda packet, the, the, the more detailed report that addressed those concerns. but. Uh, with respect to the reason they're here today is obviously to, to, to report back to answer those questions that perhaps were not addressed previously, um, which led to these, these uh, ongoing meetings. Um, obviously, the intent is to, to get the commission uh, comfortable with the efforts and, and the improvements that they've made thus far and, and have programmed going forward uh, as we uh, continue to negotiate between now and July. Uh, before the, uh, the next franchise agreement renewal that uh, it, it will expire in July of this year. So we will be bringing that back. We've actually received the draft of that franchise agreement from Duke. Um, Chris Rowe, who I believe is uh, online via Zoom and is listening in, uh, I've been working with him on, on some edits and comments and questions that I had based on the draft that was provided by Duke. He's gone through those and, and addressed those. He's listening in today to see if the commission has any additional concerns or comments that might be incorporated in, in any uh, ongoing uh, edits that uh, he'll be coordinating through Chris and, and Duke's attorney before we actually bring that to the commission. It'll be a, an ordinance, so therefore there'll be two readings. But uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Chris and he can provide the update as to the efforts that Duke's been uh, conducting ever since. All right, thank you, Jorge. Actually, uh, I'm gonna have our uh, community relations manager, Jeff Baker, he'll get the, the presentation started and we'll uh, introduce a few of our folks along the way. Okay, welcome. Good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor and Council Members and, and uh, Commissioner uh, Tornga, I don't believe we've met before, so welcome to the commission. It's good to see all of you again. Commissioner Frank, you took Half of my notes, so uh, <laughs> I guess it, I'll say you know, the only thing, um, you know, it's been uh, a pleasure working with uh, Commissioner Freeney and the staff to get to this point. I know this has been a frustrating issue for all of you, um, and, you know, and obviously with the onset of COVID, that certainly created some challenges as well. Uh, it kept us from meeting in person for, some, for a certain period of time. But um, today we have a uh, group of Duke Energy employees here 
Uh, Chris Tiedig that uh, Commissioner Freeney has talked about is in the Government Community Relations Group as well, but he oversees our right-of-way right of way agreements across the state. He's going to be our main presenter, and then we're also going to have Bob McCabe, who is uh, our uh, manager of planning, talk to you today. But in addition, we have uh, A.J. Mill with our street lighting group uh, in case you have questions about street lighting. Uh, Mike Malley, who is the city's account executive, is here as well. And then Linton Williams, who is our manager over protections, is here. So if there's any questions that are not specifically related to the report, uh, we're certainly prepared to answer those uh, to the best of our, our ability as well. So good to see you all. Thank you. And I was just going to say, you were talking about Jeff, if you know, my, my hair over COVID has gotten a little closer to his and same name. So if you, <laughs> if you jump in, I'm here for you. So. Gotcha. You are more than welcome to present from your chair there. You don't have to get up if you don't want to. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll see if I'm too tall for the microphone. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes that happens. Uh, just to give an idea of what this presentation will be, will be providing. So we're going to go through the report uh, plus a few other things. The main point, obviously, is, is grid improvements. That's, that was the main theme that we've heard and listened to. And so the, the main part of that, that report that we provided along with your staff really focused on that. So let me start with uh, a bit of what Commissioner Franey talked about is how we got here. So upon her request and along with working with, uh, with uh, Jorge, we've been addressing a lot of those old issues that really started from the 2001 and, and later supplemented in the 2003 reports. And there, there's certainly a common thread in reading those old reports that uh, the city commissioned back then, and that was a lot of concerns relating to the reliability uh, the, the condition of our system. So what do, we, what do we do back then to address those issues that were raised and what are we doing now? And of course, what are we gonna do in the future? So we really took a, a, a four-pronged approach in that, in that detailed report. So we wanted to, to specifically address several items in those old reports. And then that, that's fine because that really addresses the past, uh, but really looking at what did we do since Hurricane Irma. We know that's a, a pain point. So starting at Hurricane Irma, what did we do with grid improvements with then, uh, really the recent history, what recent projects were completed, and what are we doing now and in the future? So that grid improvement section really focuses on that. I, I do realize there's a lot of technical language in there. We try to kind of take as much of that out as possible and show on, on a map and where things happen, where do we do some of those projects. There's a lot of different types of projects too, and we can go through that in this presentation. Bob will really uh, do a good job in laying that out for you. The third thing was the sustainable energy, and we know that's really the future, so EV charging, the city's already done a good job taking advantage of that through a, a program that was released through Duke two years ago. Uh, also, the, the clean energy connection, which is solar. So uh, Jeff will come back and touch a little bit more on that. The appendix, uh, if there's a boring part of the report, that's it. Though. So that's the kind of the long verbiage that uh, if you need to sleep, you could go ahead and read through the appendix. That gives you a lot of the uh, standard boilerplate language of a lot of what our programs do. But first, I'm gonna go ahead and talk a little bit about um, those, the, what we call the 2001, the 2003 reports. So some of the common threads in there there are several issues that, that talked about the materials we use, the, the condition of our wires, our transformers, what is Duke doing, or really what did our predecessor do at the time uh, to inspect those, to change those out, what kind of program we have in place. So going through that, um, I mean, I could personally say it was a, a bit of a humbling experience hearing the feedback from Commissioner and Jorge, Paul, Keith. Uh, they really challenged us through this whole process from May all the way through December. There was a lot of collaborative back and forth on tough questions that they asked of us. Uh, it certainly didn't make it easy. Uh, so we had to do a lot of digging to find out what did we do back then, what was the, really the state of our grid back then. It, it was really hard to get real good answers, so we did as best we could. But it was easier for us to answer what are we doing now about it, what is our transformer inspection process now. Uh, what types of poles are we putting in? What are we doing with our, our copper wire versus 
our aluminum wire, what type of feeds do we have to ensure reliability within the city. So I'm not going to go into all that detail right now. So it, again, that's all in the report. But again, the, the, the common thread of that was the reliability concerns within the city, what's going on and what are we doing about it. So a big thing is the self-healing projects, which Bob will talk about later. And that's part of our new program. It's often called Smart Grid. So you'll kind of hear some of those terms used interchangeably. But there's a lot of things that are going on that Duke has. It's, it's statewide programs, but they've already kicked off here uh, early on in this, in this city to really improve reliability. So hopefully you've seen some improvements since Hurricane Irma. We've heard that loud and clear that we need to do better. Um, so a lot of our interaction through street lighting, vegetation management especially, we feel like there's a good collaboration going on right now where we have a two-way communication going on with city staff of trimming trees, getting lights replaced, converting to LED, so things like that. So I'm going to go ahead and get something started off with grid improvements. Uh, so a big one, it's kind of something I know you all don't see because it's inside the fence of our substation. But our Dunedin substation, we did a very large project there. Uh, it, most of that work finished in 2020. And for the most part, we rebuilt just about everything inside the substation. We replaced most of the equipment. We did some environmental improvements. We added some animal control devices. So believe it or not, so animals are often one of the, the largest causes of outages inside substations. So that's raccoons, squirrels mm. climbing on top of the equipment. So we've had a really uh, take a concerted effort to add animal control devices on there. That project was around $10 million, and we didn't put dollar figures in the report on purpose. It can be kind of a misleading thing, and um, I'm comfortable telling you that that project was roughly $10 million because it, it was a, really a very extensive project, but when you compare this substation project to another one, that's why it's kind of a... It, not the easiest thing to compare apples to apples. It's hard to find one substation that's just like another one when we do a rebuild project. But um, same with all of our other rebuild projects of our lines. Uh, just want to kind of give you that kind of the, the, that forethought of why didn't we put dollars throughout that report. It's, um, it's really hard to come up with accurate numbers that truly reflect the scope of the work. But that project really was something that was um, it, it took several years to complete. We did do some final wrap-ups early on in 2021, but it was a, a, a very big project. And you'll hear Bob talk about the other substation that's in the city is our Highland substation. We've got an, uh, a big uh, project planned for that one in 2025. So you'll see um, we do have a focus on some reliability at the substation level. And there was another transmission line that was fully rebuilt as well. You'll see um, in the report, our old, our old transmission poles were made out of wood. We haven't used a wood pole in 20 years. So getting all that rebuilt and replaced with concrete or mainly steel is what we're using. That's certainly a, a good thing to hold up against the storms. I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to, uh, to Bob McCabe. He's gonna walk through the smart meters. Well, we have a couple of videos to play along with this uh, presentation that we don't have to listen to us the entire time might add a little bit more color to, to what's happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Welcome. That way I only concentrate on things I'm looking at. So again, uh, I'm Bob McCabe. I'm, uh, I'm a manager of our planning and also our filing initiatives that we do with the state. So I um, thought I'd take a moment here to talk with you all about some of the things that we've done and the things that we plan to do in the future relative to the grid. And um, uh, by the way, personal note, I was happy to see Bob Ironsmith. I worked with him many years back in the uh, early 2000s, late 90s. Amazing guy. <laughs> I got to say that, just personal opinion. So uh, back task at hand here. So uh, we have smart meters over here, and that is something I'm very proud of that Duke Energy has done. And um, it's, it gives the customers a whole lot more control over what they can, their usage. They can see what they're using on a real-time basis. I think that's pretty impressive. Uh, you can do it from the comfort of your computer rather than have to walk out the meter and take a little notes. So I, I, I'm very proud of that. And in addition, um, the smart meters 
give it the option for changes in bill due dates. Um, that's something that I think a lot of customers had looked for in the past. Sometimes, you know, you're, we tell you your bill due date was based upon when we read the meter and there's nothing we can do about it. That's what it is. That works for some people, but not for everyone. So with smart meters, uh, we're able to actually work with our customers on a date that's convenient for them. So I'm very happy to see that. Um, we also have some other potentials that you'll see in the video, uh, some outage management stuff that will be coming down the line. Uh, it's, it's not quite there yet, but that's some software additions that will be coming so that it will be able to self-report outages. Um, so that's, that's a, a coming feature. So with that, I think it'd be a good time to go ahead and play the video. Just a moment to pull it up. Gotta figure out how to reshare the screen here. That isn't right. <laughs> that can't be right. <laughs> okay. Um, you were just trying to share it. Is that what? Yeah. There. Smart meters improve your energy experience. What's the difference between a smart meter and a regular digital meter? Hmm. Simply put, two-way communication between your home and your energy provider. Smart meters allow you to see how much energy you use, when you use it, and its cost. You can use this information to monitor and potentially reduce energy use to save money. In a major outage, smart meters let us know who has power and who's without, so we can send crews where they're needed. More control over energy usage, increased efficiency, and quicker outage response are just some of the benefits of smart meters and a smart grid. We're working hard to build a smarter energy future. Uh, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, like I mentioned, yeah, the outage feature is coming. It's uh, so I still have to do some more software integration before we make that fully implemented. But uh, everything else is already online with it. And uh, another thing that customers like is we don't have to go hanging out in their backyard or having to access property quite as much as maybe we had in the past, unless there's an actual issue on property. So uh, that's another exciting feature. Uh, next thing we're looking at is our some grid improvements that we have done in the past. And um, one of the ones that I had looked at um, that was pretty impressive was the, um, well, Chris already talked some about the substation upgrades. Uh, by, by the way, is everybody familiar with transmission lines, what that means in substation? Transmission lines bring the power from our power plants, uh, long corridors over into the different locations, the substations. The substations then take that high voltage line and convert it down into what we call a primary voltage. It's about 13,000 volts. Um, we have a, a term that we call feeders. Uh, those come out of the substation and they go out into, along usually the main corridors like Main Street, Pinehurst and all that, out into the areas to serve the customers. And those main lines, those feeder lines, then have branch lines or what we call lateral lines that come off of these feeders. And those go into the neighborhoods or to the businesses to serve them. So I, I figured I should lay that out because I'm not, I don't want to assume that everybody knows what our terminology is. So the big ones are transmission lines, substation, then feeder, then lateral, <coughs> lateral lines or branch lines. I was going to say there's like a really great diagram on the last page of the report. Perfect. If anybody's really getting to it, <laughs> really excited about it, I, I found it kindergarten, which is what I need. So mm -hmm. it helps me to understand. So just adding that. It does. It makes a big difference. I mean, let's face it, it's, it's, it seems like to me, oh, yeah, of course. But to anybody else, you know, you see the thing up there on the pole and you're, oh, I don't know what that is. <laughs> you know? So I thought I would just take a moment to make sure everybody's aware of that. So um, Chris had already gone over some of the substation upgrades that we had done. And so I think we're pretty good there unless anybody had any questions on that. Um, then we move into some of the feeder upgrades that we have done. And one of the, oh. I question. had a quick question if yes. I could. Mm -hmm. um, we said uh, 12,000 uh, customers, 12,500 customers out of the Dunedin substation. Yes. Does that mean those that come off of that last shot of, of, of the lines? In other yes. words, there's, there's, there's 12,500 that are fed off that Dunedin substation. Out of that substation. So what that means is 
out of that, all those feeder lines come out, then all the lateral lines come out, then all the services. The very, when you add all those up and bring it back up to the peak, it's the 12,000. So the lateral lines are hitting 12,500. All, yeah, by the, right, from the, like a Christmas tree, if you can imagine. How many customers do you have in Dunedin? <coughs> um, that's a good question. 000, about 23,000. 23,000. Yeah. Thank you. The, um, the, the, this map up here is actually a good picture of what yeah, our substations I, serve. So like green that. is what's served by the Dunedin substation. Yes. And the pink at the bottom served by our Highland substation. So we have a couple, and then a couple other substations outside the city limits serving that that kind of northeast edge. So it's, that's what those that color coding means. Does that answer the question you're looking at? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I was looking at one of the ones that I was very impressed with was our, our subaqueous cable upgrade. Um, we actually redid our subaqueous cable running from um, mainland, I guess, out toward. Uh, the honeymoon island state park so that's a pretty big deal there it's a not an inexpensive project unfortunately i don't know how much it was but i knew, do know that we uh, installed some new line out that way and provide some redundancy out there so that going forward in the event of issues we're able to take care of it and it being underground you're not going to see any uh lines you know uh, in the water or along the causeway that would that would be carrying that power um, I think that's good for a storm perspective also. So um, we've also done some of our additional upgrades for like out by the high school. We had done some find and fix work where we actually went through the entire feeders and we looked for opportunities to fix and repair. I know that I believe there was some bamboo and some palm tree issues that were uh, that we had to take care of that were growing up into the lines. So we all know Bamboo can cause some pretty quick uh, damage. It, it grows very fast and spreads everywhere. So we were able to mitigate that by working with individuals who maybe had that on their property and resolve that and improve uh, result and some improvements for the high school. Um, one of the things that we do when we fix or, or review our feeders and look to see what we can do to fix them, we will patrol the entire feeder. We look for things that or potentially broken. There's some reliability things on there, like um, some arresters. What, what that is is like lightning. Um, if it hits a line, the arrester will stop it from progressing any further down into a home or into a business. So what we did is we look at all these arresters to make sure that they're all still in good shape. Another thing we look at is our grounding. Um, so we do have grounding all at, at all this equipment locations and in some every every uh, about every quarter mile if there's not any equipment and what that does is if a light if lightning or there's a surge that hits the line it will take that to ground so that will help protect the equipment so we verified our grounding was good we verified our arresters were good we also looked at um, our insulators on our poles we validated that all of our insulators were you know in good shape that but that's what keeps the pole or keeps the wire away from the pole. Um, if you have a bad insulator, you can have some tracking that would run uh, across the insulator and cause some issues, some power quality issues. So we did look on that. Just wanted to give you some background as to some of the things that we look for. Um, and um, I believe that we had also done some work uh, patrolling the line that was for the Blue Jays. Um, so we we spent some time looking to see what we can do to make sure that they are also receiving some uh, quality power out there too. That, so, was, that was also tied to some repetitive issues that we were having at the library adjacent to them. Exactly, I believe that was on the same feeder, the library and the, exactly. So that's what we did to, to help mitigate that. Um, you know, Bob, can I just say too, like the whole point, it was tough to get maps because they can only do so much detail. So this looks kind of interesting. But it's hard, you know, because what we really wanted was real things that were problems and real things that got fixed and some sense of customer impact. And and so this kind of was the way to kind of pull it together. I just wanted to give a little bit of background. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sometimes the map, it's like it was hard. We went back and forth about what maps can really show it <laughs> and what maps can they actually show because they do have legitimate issues with not showing too much detail. Um, so... Go ahead. Sorry. No, that's perfect. Exactly. I have a real quick question. Uh, so uh, I talked with the, with the city manager about this real quick. So just for clarification. So we list the number of customers here. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in, in actuality, you had checked the whole system. 
for all of the customers. That's so right. I'm not sure why this would just, just help me why this Oh, would I see. Well, there's different things that you can look at. So we look at the main lines and those impact all the customers on those lines. So if there's an issue on that, on that feeder line, it will impact all the customers downstream from there. Um, so by taking care of those larger, the issues on the larger lines, you're mitigating some of them that could affect many, many thousands of customers. These are just the lateral ones that we're having a, a field. Now, right. We also, and, and that's also some of the things that we had done too. We recognized that there were some laterals that would, uh, going through neighborhoods that needed some uh, looking at too, Thank and you. we did. And those, we did those targeted rather than look at every single lateral line. We looked where there were some reliability and outage issues, and we spent some time looking to see what those were. Um, we looked to see, you know, if there was any vegetation or animal issues that we needed to, to take care of. I think Chris had already mentioned before in the substation, we put up some animal mitigation. We've done that too in, um, on the feeders and in the laterals. In fact, I believe uh, one of the things that we had done was put up a, a dish for an osprey nest too. It, it had a habit of wanting to nest on our poles they look pretty fantastic, especially when you have some nice equipment up there. It's like, I can live here forever. So uh, this gives an opportunity for the, uh, us to give them a better place rather than uh, you know, our, our equipment to nest. So uh, we are pretty proud of what we've done for, as a side note, for our avian protection. Um, that is something that we have brought in in the last uh, 15 years or so, an extensive avian mitigation program where we actually have it laid out in our GIS system. We lay out where all the areas are, where there's bird concentration. And then we have areas that we, when we build new lines or, we mit or, or uh, redo lines, that we actually put prevention um, on the poles. So you may actually see that in places throughout the city. You'll look at the top of the pole and you're like, well, that pole has like this black cap looking thing on it. It looks like a little triangle. What, what's that for? That's to keep raptors from the larger birds from sitting on top of the pole, they have larger wingspans. So there's a potential where they could be the path to ground, the larger birds can. So by us putting that mitigation on these poles, we discourage them from using that as their resting spot. That's our, our primary focus when we do that. We can also add some other equipment on our things to prevent birds that, or squirrels or any other uh, animals that uh, sit on our equipment from being that potential path to ground. That's our, our biggest thing. By pat the ground, that means that it's kind of like if you put your finger in a socket or something like that, you become the path from where the power is to the earth. So our goal is to make it so that doesn't happen to an animal. So we do what we can there. And, and we have come a long ways over the last uh, 15 years or so in improving our, our mitigation there. And that does help in outages too. I know that's a little bit off topic here, but I wanted to make sure that I included that because it is some of the stuff that we do too. Um, next thing we have on here, unless there's any other questions on the feeders, I'll mention the targeted underground projects we've done. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, some of the, what we've done for targeted underground is neighborhoods that has some outage issues and or tree vegetation issues, we've taken moments to see what we can do to mitigate that. Um, a lot of times the lines will be what we call back lot or rear lot. That means they're behind the home instead of in front of the home, which was great from aesthetic purpose. Um, that's how things were done all through the 40s, 50s, 60s. Oh, keep them out of sight. Yeah, there's a lot of problems with that when it comes to the vegetation. People want their trees in their backyard. They want to have their privacy in their backyard. Um, and those two things just don't go together. Having the power lines back there, having the easements back there and all that. So by us being able to move those back from the back to the front and putting them underground, um, we're able to reduce that potential for outage. And that's what this does. There's uh, instances where we look for that, those heavily treed areas and those areas where there are a lot of outages and we use as an opportunity to put the lines underground in the front of the homes instead of the rear. And this way we don't need to go in their backyard to maintain anything, everything is in the front. Um, we did this at no cost to the customers. They had overhead lines that you know came over to their home. Not a problem, we developed a conversion kit so that we could put this on the side of the home and come underground up and tap into the existing uh, meter cans and stuff that were there. 
without having to make the customer go to an expense of redoing their electrical system, which some of the homes are, are older and they may not. Um, it could be an expensive thing for them to have to go and redo their electrical to bring it up to the very latest. This, this way we didn't need to put any un, undue burden on the city customer or on the city uh, residents. So that's I have, one of the things I have a question on that. Sure. I'm going to look at Jennifer or Jorge. We had the issue over by the that neighborhood by the Fenway yep. where where they were going to underground and something happened and I mean we were helping to pay part of that and, and then it became too expensive. So can you just remind me of what remind us what the, those details were? Because I think we had to abandon it. Well Duke didn't we? moved forward with yeah, the Duke, undergrounding. Yeah. I'm sorry, what? Duke moved forward with the undergrounding and the problem was that the easements, uh, most of the property owners, some of the property owners wouldn't dedicate the easements for the remainder of the infrastructure, and so we didn't underground cable and those types of things. That is a challenge. We do run across that because we have to have a place to, you've already mentioned in a couple of your previous uh, discussions, when you work with the private landowners like the Boy Scouts, you need an easement, a right to be there in order for you to to be able to proceed. Duke was in, in the right of way in an easement already, right? Uh, a lot of times in the back, like right. all of our stuff is in an existing easement. And, right. you know, um, actually we would have been able to abandon some of that easement if there wasn't any telecom or anybody else back there. Right. Um, but as far as we're concerned, once we move to the front, we personally don't need the easement anymore. But some residents feel that when you ask them for an easement, that they should gain something for that right for you to put the equipment there. And um, unfortunately, we're just not in a position where we can lay out, uh, have a cash layout to pay for easements. Um, so what we do is we do the best we can to work with all the residents in the area when we do these kind of projects. We look for places that are less conspicuous. We try to put them on lot lines. We try to put them in places that are not in the way of existing vegetation or trees. Um, we do, we actually have community outreach where we have people go visit all the landowners and ask them, hey, this is where we're looking to put this. We're looking to run underground from here over to there. Any questions on that? Are you good with that? So, and so how do, when you continue on doing these things, because mm -hmm. we want you to do that. Right. It's important. How do we get all the other um, utilities to buy into it too. How, well, how do we coordinate that? Um, I can respond, I guess, with yeah. respect to the city hall project. Um, there was a particular challenge there and uh, there was a need for a, an easement for the transformer and um, along Loudoun, um, just north of Virginia. We were unable to obtain that. So we, we made some alterations at, at that location. We went, uh, replaced the pole. We, we paid Duke to replace the pole and uh, essentially go underground from that point southward and then uh, obviously continued on with the rest of the project. But there are challenges when the, the uh, resident or the business owner does not want to cooperate and does not want to provide the easement. And I think that's what he was speaking to is they're not in a position to be paying for easements. But um, in, the, in the case of the city hall project, we worked with the other utility providers, Spectrum, for, uh, Frontier, um, and and uh, all the other uh, providers that basically are on their poles. And we uh, we actually paid not only Duke to underground associated with that project, but we paid those utility providers to go underground as well. Um, but that's case, different than this. Th this that case. was our own project. I'm talking about when, when Duke is... Working with neighbors. Yeah, working in neighborhood. Who coordinates? Does that end up falling on us? Um, for the most part, we let our joint users know that we're going to be doing that kind of work. And we'll ask them, you know, if, if you want to do something, we can work with you. But the majority of them choose not to. It's Duke. Yeah. yeah. But I'm just, uh, but it's Duke, you're the, you are the entity. But see, that's, yeah. that's, have, I guess what I'd want to say is, um, you know, if you're going to make that move, mm -hmm. it's, it really does serve your best interest to get them to cooperate because then you can, you are giving the customer something by removing the back easement. Mm -hmm. You're just switching and you can get those people to participate more 
if you can accomplish that. I'd, it's, I, I'm imagining a phone call to Verizon. Hey, can I? I'm going to move this. Yeah, we don't need. We don't need to invest that. Well, somehow we need to try harder. Is well, my point. We did do that. No, I know you did. Right, and and so and. You know, it was problematic because they obviously they're not going to do it, you know, gratis, and so th and that was the problem, and we couldn't get the easements that we needed, either from the property owners. So, it was a kind of a double-edged sword there. It was that the issue though. If you had everybody on board, it could have been a swap, and that might have made it more palatable. Uh, pa yeah, palatable to the homeowner. That's my point. Or because then they're like, oh, I'm doing two easements. Was that was that really at the heart of it, or was it just? Don't don't change anything on me. You're trying to steal my land. That's sometimes what it can be. Um, you know, we run into a number of things, and we are looking at some different ways of mitigating some of that going forward. The easements, um, some going forward, what we're a potential solution we're looking at is being able to use some of the city right of way for placement of our assets rather than request a dedicated easement. Obviously, we have to make sure that the city's on board with that because. Um, once our facilities are there, if we need to relocate them, then that would be the city expense, and the city may or may not want that. Um, so that would be part of the discussion. You know, not to get into the weeds here, but yeah, I'm sure if you have poles, okay, and you have other utilities attached to those poles, couldn't, again, I'm not trying to tell you how to run your business, right. but if they want to hook up to your poles, then they have to participate in the movement of them. I mean, I'm just saying. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah. Unfortunately, you'll have to come to a microphone. Yeah, I w I'll use the Dunedin example as the as probably the most coordinated example that has happened, and, and you see that we did not achieve that because the you, other utility providers have no obligation well, to, that's my point. to do I'm that. Saying, but if but, they, but if we, they want we can to... we can turn over ownership if they do not want to come off the pole, we can turn over ownership of that pole to them, but we cannot force them off of the pole. But that's so, what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah but the, well, I'm saying when you have an agreement yeah. with them, they have to ask permission to attach to your pole. Right, but what I'm saying that that would be, that's a statewide, I mean, it's one I of, understand, yeah. I'm just giving you a suggestion. Okay. okay. Because, yeah. I mean, it, it would, it's a, if we are really trying to improve the reliability and underground, because it's all about undergrounding here, and we know it, and we want it, and everybody else does too. But if you're really trying to get there, then you can't let other utilities hold you back. Right. Again, I'm not trying to tell you how to run your business, but if the end goal is to get that undergrounding and that is a main stop gap, you guys gotta fix that. Well, even, even when all the utilities on board, you still have the private landowner who will No, I understand, but I do think... Yeah. Well, what, that was my what, question. I is do it think the that private what, landowner in the end, or is it more that the other utilities... I think in both. this particular case, it was both, but oh. I mean, I'll give you an example. Indian Shores, for example, that entire town undergrounded probably 10 years ago. I know. But you still have private... I mean, we still have, I think it's three locations where literally at the lot line, we had to put a pole on each side of that lot line bring the utilities up, come down for those three residents because they would not give right, us a private Right, but that's, that's yeah. three locations. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is, but that's like but the metering that's issue. But, but that's what I'm saying. But some it people just, that won't do yeah, the everybody smart gets metering. Really rigged out, but so I, we have like but I know, do old fashioned think, meter guys. Reading. I do think what you said makes a lot of sense. And that is when you're swapping versus increasing yeah. the easement, I think some of that kickback is gonna go away. But you gotta get to that point. And so, I mean, as you know, government has red tape all over the place. And I see this as one big red tape, you know, as to getting closer to undergrounding, which is the ultimate goal. However you can do that, I think we need. Anyway, I wasn't trying to take us off track, but, but I was so disappointed that this project didn't work out and, and, and that the other utilities were holding us hostage for doing that. And that was very upsetting to me. Mayor, if I could, you know, I, I think however, Chris. However, those people are still going to have power, you know. So that's, yeah, I'll tell you, I'd write an easement in a minute I'd sign off. And my question is, I'm right around the 156, and I'm really thrilled that they had that opportunity. If some of them chose not to take it, you know, I can't do anything about that. My question 
because when you started it, you said that you would have a program to broaden the expanse of that. So how's that working? Because I think my neighbor underground it, and y'all's people came over and said, well, we could also do you. And I said, how much? You know, I, I'm just curious, because that was one of the things you said. You said, we're going to start here, and then we'll carry it, because we're all coastal. And so I'd like that. I would ask you to ask, uh, answer that. And then also, I really want to know, how smart are the smart meters? Are they Mensa? Because what I want to know is that they ping immediately and someone's going to be out and fixing my line. Because I, um, I mean, eight days without any power and I'm right in that area. You know, I was, you know, I hate to say this, but I was running down the street trying to find uh, y'all, Duke, or, and saying, look, just go ahead and, you know, baker at me, but I want to get out of this heat. You're either going to get to my house or you call right now and take me somewhere where it's cool. I mean, that's <laughs> how horrible it is, it that humidity after any storm. And for eight days, it is, it's Dante's Inferno. And it's along that coast, you're going to continue. So how are you going to broaden that effect? And I hope that this smart thing is really smart. IQ, Mensa, it's going to do the job. And I understand two-way communication. I'm talking about when you have an outage, because we always do, how quick do you know it and how do you respond to that? So there's several questions in this thing. How are you going to broaden the tug? Who, is it the homeowner's responsibility? Whatever. I need to know that and I need to know how quick you can really use that uh, smart grid to figure out where the issue is, and then do you send the truck or you fix it mechanically somewhere up in Oz? You know? Okay. Um, you want me to go ahead and answer some of that now? Or I can... Uh, There's I can two say... different questions here, so. Yeah. Um, where are you with the, the undergrounding? I so, think that's what she's asking. Okay, so on the undergrounding, the so the targeted undergrounding program that that is ended. We're transitioned to the what is called now is lateral hardening underground. So we talked about lateral lines, hardening them by putting them underground. So lateral hardening underground. Uh, so right now we're assessing where those locations will be. Uh, we haven't identified any new locations in Dunedin, but this is where I think um, the partnership would have to the two-way communication where if there's issues where there's an opportunities where their community wants it underground, whether it's for reliability or aesthetics or, or some other reason, that's where we can work together and do a, a project where the city would, would have to contribute. But there's other ways for that payback to happen and we, would, we could talk to you about that. Well, so I think what, okay, let me condense this. You're saying that if a community comes to you that are right down from the 156, you know, done, and say, we would all like to join together to get this done, then they would have a chance of getting it done? Well, they would have a, yes, they would have a chance, but on Duke's, on Duke's dime, right now we don't have that. It, it's not listed so it as a project. So it would that, go to the homeowners. So it would go to the homeowners or the city or a combination thereof. Okay. Like what you because it's with, not uh, a problem, because in your mind it's not a problem area. Is that why, why you're saying it? Well, you can't I mean, say that. it has to meet certain criteria, so we have to keep that, that criteria, you know. Well, I mean, I'm telling you, we got the criteria. Yeah. And we can look at that. If you have a particular area, that's something we should, we should talk to you about. Yeah, and um, also, I, I really want to know how the smart thing works when it pings. What do you do? Do you send out a truck? Do you go to Oz? How do you handle it? Um, like I mentioned before, that's, that part is still to be implemented. Those meters have the capability to do that, but they're not there yet. Um, only because we have to do software upgrades to make everything connect properly. But once it does, once all That'll that's implemented, forever. then literally it will ping it and it will say, hey, this house has no power. And we already know where this house is, what transformer it's on, what, what fuse protective device it's, it's on, what feeder it's on, and then we can, it will tell us, based on this, all of these homes are out, this is what the device is. It will say, okay, all these homes are out, that means that there's a problem at this fuse location or somewhere adjacent to it. And then you send out the truck. We send the truck. 
But then again, you know, I mean, you've got a rolling stock. And I, I mean, everybody comes from all over the nation. I got yeah. that. Mm -hmm. And that's a wonderful. Okay, so, um, you know, I had one more, but I will... I think you've heard from me enough right now. And, and by all means, we're, we're going to make sure that we answer any questions that we can for you here today. So please keep, if you don't ask it now, save it and we'll ask it later. You know, we want to make sure we answer any questions that you have, at least to the best of our ability. So, uh, yeah. So uh, we do have that target underground. The next thing we have. Oh, which, oh wait a minute. Oh, I remembered. Yeah. Okay. Because 156 mm -hmm. are already undergrounded in my neighborhood. Right. Does that actively help the rest of the neighborhood? Or does that just mean I have to run down there and stay with them a week? It can, <laughs> it can help. It kind of goes to that grid thing we talk about. Um, what you can, if they had problems on their overhead lines, sometimes their problems could cause a fuse or a protected device to trip that's further upstream. And now it will take your power out and their power out. But now because they're all underground, they will not be the cause of your problem, <laughs> is the plus side. Um, so that, that is a they don't a, actively a protect us because, I mean, they're sort of an island to themselves. They will not cause problems for you by them having... We'll just cause problems for ourselves. I, I can but, say that, it's, no. that there's going to be, there's no, all, no, there's gonna be outages. No, no, you can, they, she, they can cause problems for the underground, right? But not the reverse. Yes. Right. The underground, right. I mean, but how can we cause problems when they're undergrounded? I don't yeah, know. it all depends on the configuration. You know, there's always potential where they'll have no effect to you, and neither of you will be uh, affecting each other. You'd have to look at that on a grid perspective, look to see how everything's lined up. But um, for the most part, you should be islands unto yourselves, and it shouldn't. You, they shouldn't affect you. You shouldn't affect them. Um, but you know, you'd have to look at the actual grid to see if there there was any specific ties. Uh, yes. Uh, if I start time, just talk specifically to the incidents that happened in Dunedin and uh, the uh, situation. The substation, the Dunedin substation that we had made the significant investment in was out. It doesn't make any difference at that point. If you're underground, overhead, uh, when your substation is out, no one is receiving power. Because if I'm correct, I think Mayor, your home is underground. It is, right. but I was out, she would, but it was a point. bad transmission yeah. or transformer. Sorry, it was a bad, I don't know what, but yeah. But that, that's I was out for seven she, days. She was out as well. Brutal. Because again, when the substation is out, it doesn't make any difference. Because there is no true underground system. Because again, the, the power starts at the power plant. It, it's over, then runs over transmission lines. If those transmission lines are down, again, what happens downstream um, you know, it doesn't make any difference overhead underground. So then once you get to the substation, in this case, in Dunedin's case. And in this case, yeah. you just harden the library and stadium. So for the, that particular area, that should give a little more protection. Correct? Not only that, that segues into the next thing that we have right here, which is the self-healing projects. Um, what we've done on the feeders is we've actually taken devices and put them on different locations in the feeders, and we've also upgraded segments of line um, so that they can interconnect. So, like I mentioned, you have these long lines that run out of the substations and it all branches out. Now we made it, rather than one long line, you have interconnections. So that, say something happened on one part of that feeder, it will automatically reconnect and it, through a grid process and bring those other customers up. There'll still be a segment in the affected area that will still have no power, but for the most part, many of the customers will c get power back almost immediately. That's what the self-healing project does. We install automatic, automated switching so that it will automatically bring power back up and isolate that area. Um, and I believe we have a video that we can show relative to that too, kind of give you uh, an example of exactly how that works. It's uh, very exciting. So you are going to see us, um, you have seen us, and you will see us, I believe, this year in the city upgrading some lines in preparation for some more equipment. We've already done nine of, the city has 12 feeders, we've already done nine of the feeders, put that equipment on it, 
and we have three more left to go, and we will look to have those complete by around 2025. That's our goal, is to have the entire city on a, a smart grid for... And, and, and we're not going to have a hurricane until 2025. <laughs> Well, we have some of it planned for 2022. I just, like I say, our goal is for everything to be done by 2025. Um, you know, we, we do the best we can, but um, like I mentioned, we, we have a, a large area. We do the best we can to cover as many bases as we can, and we um, do, you know. Vice Mayor, if I could help them out a little bit. Um, it, it's not too dissimilar from a water distribution system. Say you're on a cul-de-sac at the end of the street and you're on the dead end of that line. If for some reason there's a break in that line upstream, then you're out of water. This, what this would be is something similar to a loop system. So if there's, that break occurs upstream of your house, there's a way to valve it off and you can still be fed from another area. So it's not dissimilar to that. I like the self-healing idea. Yeah, it, it does, it's gonna do a lot. Um, you know, can I say it's gonna be the panacea for a Cat 3 hurricane hitting this area, or even a Category 2, I, I can't say that for sure. Um, we're doing what we can. Like uh, Chris had mentioned before, we've upgraded some of the structures. Uh, the wood poles are gone for much of our transmission. We've moved to steel and concrete because, you, like you had mentioned, I personally also have underground, but I had no power for seven days because the, trans the, the, the entire substation was out. And that was due to transmission poles. So we are taking those steps to rectify that now so that at least that will hopefully not be the situation going forward. And your problems were during Irma? Yep. Yeah. What you're talking about? And a lot of these improvements you're talking about now have been done since Irma? Many of them, and we're continuing to do them. We have uh, a plan in place that's actually over the next 30 years. Now, it doesn't mean you're waiting 30 years, but I'm saying it's over the next 30 years to completely harden the entire Florida infrastructure. Do, do you all um, statewide have the obligation to at a, at a certain date to have the self-healing software in? What, what's the date that every place in the state of Florida that you? We, we, don't, we aren't mandated to, but we have a goal to have it complete now by 2025. Well, I'm, I'm working on that plan right now. Our goal is to have it complete by 2025, uh, and I'm hoping that we can meet that. Okay. And nine of, the, nine of our 12 feeders are done already? Are done already, and we're working on a couple of them right now. Uh, on two more of them right now, there'll just be one left, and, uh, and that should be done by 2025. I always say I caveat that with the should and goal because, obviously, to your point, storms, um, we do what we can to make sure that we meet those goals. Sometimes things happen that can prevent that. Um, COVID has also caused our own issues, supply chain issues. We've had problems getting material. I'm sure the city has run into that same thing, unfortunately, but we're all working around it, and our goal is to still make that happen. All on that video ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Go ahead. Every once in a while, it happens. An unforeseen incident occurs, and you lose power. But what if there were an electrical system that automatically reconfigured itself? So when an unexpected event happened, the problem was isolated and the power stayed on in most areas. At Duke Energy, we're making this kind of self-healing system a reality. We're investing in advanced technologies that are transforming the grid into a dynamic electrical system with the ability to automatically detect, isolate, and reroute power when a problem occurs. How does a self-healing system work? Let's take a look. Welcome to Orchard City, a community probably very much like yours. It's made up of residential and business customers, some with critical power needs, such as hospitals and data centers. Orchard City's data center, school, hospital, and select homes are served by the Miller Street substation. Now, let's see what happens when something causes the power to go out. Without a self-healing system, the power line damage could mean a power outage for many of these customers. A large part of the community could go dark until Duke Energy crews were able to locate the problem and make repairs. But thanks to self-healing technology, digital smart sensors at substations and on power lines detect the problem and communicate with the control system. Switches automatically isolate the damaged section of line. The control system continually monitors the state of the grid and determines the best way to reroute power to as many customers as possible. 
the control system automatically reconfigures the electric grid to restore power on the undamaged section of line. In our animation, we slowed this process down so you can see the series of events. In reality, this entire self-healing process typically occurs in less than a minute. Customers whose power was rerouted may have experienced the entire self-healing process as a brief power interruption rather than a full outage. Self-healing technology also improves how quickly power can be restored. Once Duke Energy line crews complete their repairs, a system operator can return the electrical system to its normal configuration with a single command, eliminating the need for manual switching. These investments in modernizing the grid bring many benefits. First, we now have more information about the state of the grid. Second, the control system continuously assesses the state of the electrical system for potential issues that could arise. And third, as you saw in Orchard City, the system can perform enhanced restoration to the grid. The system can rapidly detect and isolate problems, protecting the portion of the grid experiencing failure from the rest of the system. The result is, fewer customers experience a sustained outage during repairs, and power is restored faster. From improved reliability to faster restoration, Duke Energy is investing in self-healing technologies to better serve your needs. That uh, help kind of sum up what I was saying? It's like a stent in your heart. Uh, <laughs> yeah, keep, keep things flowing is the goal, obviously. Yeah, so um, I'm pretty proud of that program. I think that uh, it's going to do a lot for many customers. You know, it's like I say, nothing is a panacea unto itself. But when you put all these things together, the programs together that we're working on, the goal is to make it that our, or at least our reliability is much better than it had been in the past. So, and we're always looking to do that, give our customers more reliable power. So, um, I know that uh, we talked a little bit about the things that we have done in the past and a little bit touched on some of the things that we're doing going forward. And uh, that's where we, I believe we are right now. Um, I had mentioned that we had already done nine and we have three more left to go. Um, we're in the process of installing some of the equipment on the other three this year. And then we are on track to be able to hopefully get it all done by 2025. Some of the things, uh, the equipment is reasonably fast to do, put up, get in place. That's why we can say we can do that one year. Some of the other things take more time. Like we have some plans to upgrade some sections of feeder. You'd seen how they rerouted power from one place to another. Well, you have to make sure that those conductors can handle all that additional load. So that's what we do as part of this process is we say, okay, we're going to need to go over here. And I can be very specific. Um, we are planning on doing some reconductor work along MLK. Uh, that's for feeder C106. That's along MLK from San Christopher south to around Lorraine Leland Street. We're going to upgrade some smaller wire to the larger wire so that this conductor will now be able to be part of that self-healing grid. That's one location we're doing. Another one is over on C107, and we're going to replace some, um, some existing fraught copper wire to um, a larger aluminum wire so we'll be able to do the same thing. And that's uh, from Broadway Monroe South to Broadway Scotland, and that's about 1,000 feet. Another section we have is for C2806, uh, and that's to replace some uh, number six copper or number two copper wire that we have there to the larger aluminum feeder wire. And uh, that is from Bell Trees Broadway going east to Bell Trees Milwaukee for about uh, 2,000 feet. So that's, that's scheduled for 2022. So I, I appreciate the city because we're going to be in your streets, in your right of way, doing work. And I know that it's not convenient for the residents when we um, sometimes are traffic impediments. We'll do everything we can to make sure that the work is seamless and impactless as possible to the customers. But um, that is work that we will be doing in 2022. Um, and of course, we do have the underground project that uh, we had just talked about for City Hall. I think that's an amazing thing, and we always offer that to any municipalities, any municipalities anytime they want. Um, one of the things that we had talked about is we look at making sure that we credit the city for the value of things that we would be doing in the future toward that undergrounding project. So if we had to 
upgrade those lines, and we knew we had to upgrade those lines in the future, in the near future, we're going to make sure that the city receives appropriate credit where they should for that kind of work. Um, there is a formula on uh, line for doing this kind of work, the undergrounding work that we follow. And basically, we give you credit for the entire value of a storm-hardened project, overhead project, as a credit toward your undergrounding. So it's, it's, it's a plus thing toward helping you in those decisions when you decide you want to do that in your communities. I know that Bob Ironsmith has always been big on aesthetics, so <laughs> he may come knocking on your door from time to time. I'm sure he's always got ideas. He does, always. always. <laughs> yep, that's the Bob I remember. So, <laughs> so um, that's some of the things that we have going forward. And of course, like I mentioned, some of the self-healing projects that we have, adding that additional equipment that will be complete by 2025. That's our goal, is for that to be complete by 2025, and the entire city will be, um, at that point, smart grid. And our goal is to make it to the so the outages will be much less in duration and fewer and far between. So I think, um, was there any other questions you had relative to this? Any well, why don't we, we just get, so we're going to, once we get, if everybody's okay, once we get to the end of your presentation. More questions. We're going to have more questions. Yes, we're trying not to interrupt you too much unless no, no, it's I'm, specific, yeah. but um, we'll probably take a little five-minute break, too, before we get into that. That's good. And I think, um, yep, we talked about smart grid. And what was the next thing? Oh, yeah, the street lighting. Um, that, that's kind of the thing that's uh, near and dear to my heart only because uh, I started with the company and I was in street lighting. I worked with Bob Ironsmith at that time. I knew him as well. We did a lot of the little street lighting together at the beginning of my career. So uh, one of the things that we've done is, or have done in the past and continue to do is whenever you have the large events for the Toronto Blue, uh, Toronto Blue Jay Stadium, we proactively check out the lighting and make sure that it's all working properly. Um, obviously, this is a, a face for both Duke Energy and the city to have operative lighting when you have events. So that is something that we do want to do. And uh, we, we did have the recent... Um, changes in our rates starting in January, and that actually is working as a benefit for the city, you are going to see a decrease of relative to your lighting account um, as part of that. And we also uh, have converted about 90% of the existing lighting throughout the city of Dunedin to LED from high pressure sodium. Um, so I think that's pretty good too. So any questions on the lighting? Um, I've got a number of questions, so I don't even want to Okay, I don't yeah. want to interrupt. I want to let, let you get okay. to a point where we can. And we'll, yeah, we can revisit. And I think uh, from there, we are back to electric vehicle charging. And I think that was. Speaker. Valley, wasn't it? Okay. Um, as you know, we've partnered very closely with the city to uh, um, provide electric vehicle charging stations. It's one of those things where, obviously, you know, we believe that electric transportation is the future. And so everything that we can do um, to ensure that, especially in high corridors and things of that nature, uh, that we are able to meet the needs of, you know, the citizens, uh, but, but also, you know, the city as well. So um, we, had, we had a program that was called Park and Plug um, that um, and just so you understand when I say we had program, everything that we do obviously is regulated. And, and um, in 2017, when, our, when we went to the commission for our 2017 to 2021 programs, the park and plug was in there. Uh, and that particular program, we were uh, allowed to place 530 EV charging stations uh, throughout our service territory. Uh, 500 were um, traditional level two charging stations, three of them were, um, I mean, 30 of them were the fast charging stations. Um, and obviously in the city, uh, we placed 10 of those uh, here locally, you know, working with the city staff. Um, and for, for our most recent settlement with the, the Public Service Commission for 2022 through 26, you know, we do have, we don't, it's, it's not, because uh, of all of these, we, we installed at our expense and we maintain them um, currently. And then at some point we will turn over ownership to the city on these. 
but uh, going forward, because I, I know the city does still have an interest in EV charging stations, we've developed a new rebate program. So it doesn't pay the full cost of the charging station now, but we do have some incentives available to uh, all of our customers, you know, to um, uh, help encourage them to uh, provide more EV charging stations. We, we can go on to the next slide. And then talking about solar energy. Now, one of the things um, I, I'm sure you all recall that you know, we had to come before you to, for what's called the clean energy connection. Uh, one of the things that Duke Energy is doing is creating a subscription service that allows customers who choose to uh, participate in this program pay a small premium up front for their power. Uh, and for the first couple of years, you will be paying a premium, but uh, as these credits grow, you, know, you will actually end up saving money. Uh, and that's a 30-year program, and it's one of the things where um, the city of Dunedin was one, one of the participants in that. And you know, you know, we know that you are all uh, heavily engaged in the Ready for 100 pledge, and, and like you, Duke Energy, we are working to meet uh, a net zero goal by 2050 as well. Um, the, the good thing about, I think, about cities like Dunedin, you know, right in, in Pinellas County, we have a, a, a pretty active sustainability network, if you will. I know Natalie participates in that. And just to give you a sense of how well this program was received in Pinellas County, you know, we're in 100 cities and 35 counties, but of all the municipalities, when we subs subscribe municipalities, over 80% of the solar allotment that will go to municipalities in our service territory, more than 80% of it will be coming to uh, Pinellas County because we had, you know, it was, it was very well received in Pinellas County. Can't say why it was not well received in other areas of the state, but, um, you know, so we thank you for um, choosing to participate in the Clean Energy Connection. And, you know, ultimately, from the city standpoint, it's a, a, a great financial incentive as well over the life of the program. So, yeah. So and now we we're at, hmm. now we're at the question phase. So all right. Well, why don't we choose this break. moment to take a little break because I, I know we all probably have a lot of questions and want to try to make it organized and okay. So we'll sounds good. Take a little five minute break.
bring ourselves back to order. Um, um, sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll start with you, Commissioner Franey, since you're part of the team that's been working on all of this, if you have questions or whatever. Um, well, I actually had a question that came up recently when I was talking to the homeowners, the Waybridge homeowners, and a gentleman um, basically told me that his, I don't have solar, so I can't relate to this, but um, that the base rate for his solar has gone up, and um, and it seemed like it increased, you know, in a large way. Um, and the, I guess that's part of my question. The other part is, you know, there's legisl legislation happening up in Tallahassee right now, and, um, and of course, we're against it, but uh, on net metering, and I'm just wondering some, some your guys' perspective of if that passes, what the impact would be to our um, residents that do have solar. So those two questions. First, the base rate increase, and then secondarily, the legislation. Yeah, I'll talk about the base rate increase, and now that does not apply just to solar customers, to be clear. Uh, it applies to all of our customers. Uh, we have increased uh, our base rate to $30. Um, so every customer that is connected to the grid, their minimum bill now is $30. What and was what, it before? Yeah. Um, we, we didn't have what we called a, a minimum bill at Duke Energy. We, all we had was a meter charge. Um, I will say that, you know, in the um, area, I think our, our, our new minimum charge is pretty competitive. I believe Tico's is 25 with Lacucci Co-op. is I know it's higher than ours. I'm not exactly sure what, what, it, uh, what it is. But just to help you understand the reason behind that $30 minimum charge, um, for the next 10 years, our cap... Yeah, before you do that, what was the minimum charge? Well, I said it was a meter charge. I want to say it was $12 and... It was like $12.83. It was 12 and, and change. I don't, I don't know the exact number. But so we, that is a huge, huge... Right. Huge um, jump. Um, but, but now it, it is only impacting a very small percentage of our customers. Where I've had... Because I've had plenty of calls on this issue it, where if you've got people who have a boat dock or ex, for example or if they have um some people have a, a garage behind their home that's you know separately meet it, metered for whatever reason so uh, we're having a lot of you know a lot of calls from customers about that but but let me try to help you understand the philosophy philosophy behind that minimum charge uh, our capital expenditure plan for the next 10 years in florida is 6.5 billion dollars um, and whether you use one kilowatt of electricity or whether you use a million kilowatts of electricity, you are benefiting from all of those technologies that uh, we were just talking about. So, you know, your usage, you know, again, if you are a very low user and, you know, you have an outage and that smart grid technology, um, you know, shortens that outage, yeah, you may not be using a lot of electricity, but you are benefiting from all of that technology. So, um, and if you look at, I mean, not to get too mathematical here, but you know, if you take 6.5 billion, which is our capital, um, ex, you know, capital plan for the next 10 years, divided by, we have 1.9 million customers. Uh, if you do that calculation, I believe right offhand, that's $3,400 per customer. You take that $30 a month charge over that next 10 years, that um, pretty much equals, uh, it, I mean, it's, it's off just, you know, you know, I mean, when you're talking billions, it's off, you know, a, f a few millions there, but it's one of those things where that's basically the premise behind the, the customer charge because, you know, we're investing significant money in the future over the last five years, we have invested significant money in all of these technologies, and the, de the decision was made that you know, all of our customers should share in that cost rather than it be tied strictly to usage only. So are solar customers hurt uh, more by that? Well, I would say it, it depends Affected. on, I would, I would say it depends on how, how if you have a, a solar system that, let's say you, because again, keep in mind, uh, a lot of solar customers think that they're not using our power. Uh, most solar customers, you know, solar on a very good day, uh, the what's called capacity factor, meaning the amount of time that
that it is producing solar is in the low 30 percent. So the mid 60 percent of the time you are using Duke Energy Power. Most people that have solar, they still receive a bill from Duke Energy because they do not generate enough to uh, cover the, you know, the amount of power that they're using from us. But if you do, if you have someone who has ideally sized or, or oversized their system, um, you know, historically in that case, if let's, let's just use a thousand to make it simple. If they were, you know, using, if they were producing a thousand kilowatts of power and then they were returning, uh, you know, but they're returning a thousand kilowatts to our system and then they're using a thousand kilowatts, the only thing that they would have received the charge for would have been the $12.83 plus whatever, you, you obviously have the franchise fee and the municipal tax. Um, so there are some solar customers that will be impacted by that, but I, you know, most of the solar customer right now, and I wish Commissioner Gow was here so I could ask him where, where he was, but most customers would not see a change because of, of their solar system, because most are not returning back uh, you know, in excess of what they're using from us. Gotcha. So then the legislation question on net metering. Uh, the legisl that particular one, Duke Energy has not taken a position on that bill. Uh, it's one of those things, you know, we uh, certainly support customers' rights to have solar. Um, I don't know why my mouth's getting all dry today, but. <laughs> you know, we support, support, you know, our customers having solar. We're adding about 1,500 customers a month. Uh, the Duke Energy System has more uh, solar customers on it than any other utility in Florida including the one that happens to be three times larger than us and maybe the or organization that um, you know is advocating for this net metering bill. Um, but we haven't taken a position on it. Um, it. It's one of those things where, you know, our, our philosophy is, you know, if a, a customer wants the, um, the right to do that, then we're, then we're certainly uh, willing to support their right to do that. The one thing I will share with the commission, just from you know, my experience on this, this issue, um, if the legislation passes, um, the good news, as I read the bill, the last time I saw it, there was a 10 year, in other words, if you are already on net metering, um, you will remain on net metering for 10 years. So what that does is it protects the customer who what, let's say you went out two years ago and you put solar on your home and you know you did it you, you know personally i'm the kind of person i hope that the reason people are doing it are doing solar is you know for the right reasons of the environment not necessarily for cost savings but let's say you can't you were the customer who did it strictly from a cost benefit analysis you know, if you, if you invested $30,000 two years ago and the calculation was that, you know, you were going to get a payback in seven to ten years, if our state, if the bill passes, um, did like the state of Nevada did, because when Nevada passed it, it immediately net metering went away. Um, and so those customers, you know, were, you know, who did it for financial reasons were significantly impacted because you know, the investment that they thought was going to have a, a seven to 10 year payback now went to a 25 to 30 year payback. Uh, so it's one of those things where if it does pass, at least there are protections, uh, limited protections, 10 years for the customers that are already, you know, on solar. So I think that's, um, you know, a positive thing. But our, our official position as a company, as a company is, you know, we are not taking a position on that bill. So. Who's pushing the bill? Um, I don't know with certainty, but I suspect Who do you suspect? It, I would suspect it is the, a larger utility in the state of Florida. One that starts with the word Florida? I, I'm just, That's what I, I understood, yeah. So, Mo, would you I, just... I, I think, I, again, I don't know with certainty, but I think they are, they're publicly saying they're supporting it, but would I don't you, know Would that. you speak to what the net metering is? Okay. So what, net, what net metering is, um, and net metering... Um, there's, and when it comes to solar, there's basically two ways to, to meter it. 
you have bi-directional metering and you have net metering. What net me metering says is, going back to my 1,000 kilowatt example, um, you know, your system produces in excess while it, during the afternoons, hot sunny day, you're, you produce more than a thousand, you produce a thousand kilowatts and send it back to our system. By law, we are required to buy that. Uh, you know, we can't say, we don't need your power today, whatever, we have to take that power. Um, and, then, and then, when using my example of the evenings and everything, you use a thousand kilowatts of our power. When we send that back on a net metering system, without customer charge and things like that, that would be a zero bill. Bi-directional metering, it works the same way, except when the utility buys the electricity from the customer, they buy it, I and mean, it's, it's set differently in each state, but in most cases, it's, they buy the power back from you at whatever the prevailing wholesale rate is. So in other words, if we can generate power for 6.2 cents a kilowatt, but we charge 11.9% per kilowatt, when that, in that customer, I can't, obviously can't do the math in my, I should have picked better numbers, so I could have done it in my head real quick, but that customer only receives the credit that the utility was offset, because you know, if we can generate power at a cheaper price, then um, you know, the logic behind it is if we can generate it ourselves for this price, why would we pay someone else a higher price? So in essence, the idea is, is that they're trying to get rid of net metering so that that's the system right, you would use. Right, obviously that's a huge disadvantage to customers who yeah. are sold. Well, and, and the thing to okay. think about, and, and I know this is a kind of a, 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 it's a silly example, but I'll try to use it, uh, you know, to just to make the point. I mean, the challenge is, I mean, right now, you know, I don't think any utility in the state of Florida has more than maybe just a, you know, a small percentage of their customers on uh, solar. So, you know, is it truly affecting the bottom line of utilities? You know, not in any significant way. But if you did have a situation where you had 30% participation, 40%, you know, basically, because again, keep in mind, all of these solar customers are still utilizing every bit of our technology and expenses. So if you got to a point to where you had you know, massive solar, um, you know, privately owned solar, the cost to maintain the grid would be spread among far fewer people. So obviously it would increase the rates to the, the, the non-participating customers. So, the example I've used before, and again, it's silly, I recognize that, but um, Mayor, what's your favorite restaurant? Oh, I'm not answering okay. that question. <laughs> <laughs> I would get her in No way, Jose. <laughs> but they we'll, know. We'll, we'll pick a restaurant in St. Pete. Um, let's say Ruth Chris Steakhouse, we'll use that as an example. There you go. <laughs> um, you know, you decide that, you know, I wanna go to Ruth Chris tonight. Um, but I'm going to bring my own steak, I'm going to bring my own wine, I'm going to bring my own potato, and you go in there, and you sit down at their table, their beautiful table, and you eat your steak, your potato, and your wine. Do you owe Ruth Chris any money? You know, it's one of those things where, because that's really what's happening for these customers who- Like a corking thing. You, corking. It's one of those things where, um, and actually, and that's really, you know, uh, you know, we can now call that our corkage fee. I kind of like that, but um, but you know, it's one of those things where these a solar customer who again is at that perfect thousand give take where they're paying nothing. Again, they are utilizing every piece of equipment that Bob has talked about and and everything. So, um, you know, I can understand you know why there are utilities pushing for the move away from net metering to where, so they can buy that power, you know, for what it would cost them to produce. You know, net metering absolutely encourages uh, people to, um, adv to advance solar. You know, so it's one of those things where, uh, I mean, I, I can't sit here and predict to you what's gonna happen, but um, I do see, you know, it, you know, 
as the rules are written today, you know, and in, in my opinion, the solar customer of today is being subsidized by the rest of the ratepayers. And so I think that is the logic behind the, the, the wish to change. Um, but, you know, we certainly, you know, our utility is we're not, we're not at a point today where it's making a significant enough impact that uh, we are that we would be advocating for change on this issue. So. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, I mean, I'll let everybody else obviously had tons yeah. of times to ask questions. So, okay. yeah. Commissioner Twonga, questions? Big, the big questions and all of that. Yeah, whatever um, you think is important, sure. I'm sorry? Whatever you think is important yeah. for this conversation. Absolutely. Sure. Um, we've, uh, I, have, I have talked uh, before about, you know, the cost of going, of going uh, total, total undergrounding, and we, and we know it's been a lot. We've asked that, I asked that question back in 2017, I think, and it was huge. It was, couldn't even comprehend what, how big that was. And I didn't know if that was really the answer to the issue, because obviously, you brought it. You one of you said that your your power was out for seven you know, for seven days or whatever, and and that was upstream. And so what are you what are you going to do if it's upstream? But what is what is the most effective way for us to ensure in the quickest way possible that the upstream is good? Is it through this this uh, um, this smart system is is that what is going to is really going to help us the most at this point in time? That's the first question. Yeah, well, I mean, the the bigger thing is us storm hardening our system because um, you know literally from the power plant to your home, everything needs to be in perfect shape um, for you to have power. So you know we're investing you know significant amounts of dollars into hardening the transmission system. You know as Bob alluded to, um, we, you know, we've moved away from uh, wood poles in the transmission system. We are it, you're seeing and a lot of the what we call lattice structures. That's the big towers. And everything we're moving away from those as well to what we call monopoles, which uh, much stronger. Um, you know so secure the system from the plant to the substation is step one. Make the improvements in the substation like we have done in Dunedin uh, recently to ensure that that equipment is uh, able to withstand the challenges of the storm environment that we live in. You know, we're, uh, the program, because we talked a little bit about tug, I know when, when uh, Mr. Kynes was talking about it. We talked about tug, but the program that we're now, we, we're continuing to do that, but what we're calling it now is called substation optimization. So what we are doing is basically looking at the reliability uh, from each one of our substations. And when, you know, when the substation is found to be um, one of the uh, less reliable substations, you know, we are doing all of the work from around in that whole substation, rather than moving from, you know, the targeted undergrounding project, for example, we were moving from this neighborhood to this neighborhood to this neighborhood. So now we're doing, you know, we're, we're doing all the work that needs to be done to improve the reliability of, of that substation, you know, one substation at a time. Um, and so that, you know, will continue over, you know, the next, you know, 10 years. But um, the point about two things about undergrounding that everyone needs to understand. First and foremost, if you're undergrounded, that does not prevent you from having out, an outage, as the mayor can attest, because she's uh, underground. You know, she's she was underground at that time. Um, and secondly, underground. You know, if you just look, and it makes sense if you think about think it through. When you have a power outage and you're underground, it actually uh, the uh, Average underground power outage is longer than an overhead outage. Reason being is with an overhead outage, you know, it's very easy for us to roll a truck to. If it's a fuse or something like that, it's fixed instantly. So, you know, st statistically, you, know, you have fewer outages on underground utilities, but you have longer duration outages. 
My second question, you just started answering or almost answered it. What's the disadvantage of having underground? I've never heard anybody ask that question yet. What's the disadvantages of having underground? Well, I would say, I mean, those two That's things, it. I would, would say, yeah. Um, ex That's panel of experts, you all have a... Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that is the biggest one, is that because you have to isolate where the mm -hmm. salt is, you have to dig it up and repair it, and that takes longer. Now, our, we do put it on a loop system, so if a primary, the high voltage stuff goes bad underground, you can isolate it, you can switch it out, and get people back up quicker. But if it's your service line running to your house, that can take a bit longer. Um, and a lot of times what we end up doing is temporary repairs and coming back within a week or two later. For those who live in underground neighborhoods, you may have seen that. Because we can't just go trenching in a new wire and have to locate some place uh, before you can go trenching. So there's those disadvantages there. But for the most part, um, you know, you're, you're, you are going to have fewer outages, but it's going to be longer duration, like you said. That's the only one. Also, we talked, thank you very much, we talked about the smart metering, and we said at some point in time it is going to be very smart uh, in the near future, sometime in the near future. Yeah. I would say it's pretty smart already. The okay. reason why I would say that is, you know, for example, just from my personal phone, I can go right now and look and see how much power did I use yesterday at 3 o'clock at my house, which that's technology that's available. And when I say me, it's not me because I'm an employee. That's available to any customer. Uh, so you can get a daily readout of your usage. Um, you know, I'm one of those people, I look at mine. Obviously, I'm in the business. I look at mine, and I'm like, what the heck was I doing yesterday at 6 p.m. and why? You know, why was there a skyrocket? So, we that we have that technology available, which I think, from a customer perspective, is the most impactful. The other thing too, it allows our customers to say, you know, if you are a financially challenged individual and you really need to keep your bill at $100 a month or whatever, you can go in there and program it to where. Um, you know, we will send you usage alerts because let's say it's the third day of your billing cycle and you've already used twenty dollars worth of power, you're probably going to exceed a hundred dollars during that billing cycle. So we can send a usage alert. I actually got a usage alert yesterday, which makes sense because I have been using my heat, Iridian, uh, a lot in the last couple of weeks. So I got a usage alert telling me that I need to either curtail my usage or expect a higher bill. So that technology is there. The other thing about, you know, we talked about pick your own due date, uh, which again, especially for our financially challenged customers, that is huge. The other thing about, we, we have a system called Ping It. Uh, well, right now, um, it, you know, it, and that's where Bob was talking about it, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bob, but right now it's not automatically telling us that there is a, an outage at uh, Commissioner Freeney's house, but if Commissioner Freeney calls in to us and says, hey, I've got an outage at my house, mm -hmm. through our ping it system, you know, this is live today, you know, we can ping the meter at uh, Commissioner Freeney's house to see if, um, if power is getting to her, you know, to her meter. Okay. If the power is getting to the meter, then we know that it's inside trouble and rather than us having to roll a truck out to say, ma'am, it's your breaker switch here. Uh, you know, so from a customer I would have checked the breaker. Well, Come on. You, I, I know you would have. <laughs> but, um, but, but I'm saying, but that's going to be significant cost savings to um, us as a utility uh, and ultimately our customers because it's going to um, – um, prevent a lot of unnecessary uh, truck rolls. The other thing where I think it's going to be, um, I mean, I, I hate, you know, let's face it, I know y'all are all very disappointed with, our, uh, with us at Irma, but, but don't ever forget, we were disappointed with ourselves as well. You know, I, you know, I had to be on those calls with, you know, the mayor and things like that. So, I, again. You poor thing. That, that that was you know let's face it it was not a and, and oh that street know, julie was definitely out for that one it, but I was saying, it, it, it was not a pleasant time for us either i mean mm -hmm. i just will make that very clear but one of the things that you know we obviously had some significant technical challenges during that storm uh we were telling people who had power that they didn't have power we were telling people who, who didn't have power that they did have power with this pingit system now you know if you're if you, if you have someone at a shelter 
and there's a question whether or not there's power at their home, we can ping that house and say, you know, especially if you're dealing with someone with a uh, special need or whatever, rather than sending them to their house thinking that they have power for them to get there and not have power, you know, we can check to make sure that, you know, power is at least getting to the meter. That doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that it's, if something, if the meter's been damaged or something like that, or they've had damage to their home. But in the smart meter, can't I do that myself to see if I've got power, something happening at the house? I could do that myself. And I want to ask in, in concert with Commissioner Kynes, she was asking, you know, when we have these storms, how much do you all know? How much will you know using this the smart metering system as to where the problem is? Uh, for example, for example, when we get a storm, I get tons of calls and the people want to know. They say, okay, hey, John, what are we going to do? Who's going to call these folks? We got, we're out of power. And I, I go, I get out in the Jeep and I ride along and there's five houses that are out and nobody else seems to be out. I can, I don't have to ping anything. I can see their lights that are on, et cetera. But there's four that are out. Um, I don't know who's calling who or they want me to call. They call, they call and they want me to call. Well, it seems like with a smart meter, you would be able to see that. Is that not correct or? Um, I'm good. That, that's what our goal is right now. Like I mentioned before, right now, it's just a matter of getting all of our softwares. Uh, software, uh, I'm sorry, you're going to have to come to the microphone because they can't pick it up otherwise. Yeah, uh, I kind of mentioned a little bit earlier. Right now, we're in the process of upgrading our software to make it so that those two, those things will properly connect and, and do what we need it to do. Uh, we have the meter capability. It's, uh, it's like you have to get all the pieces all in place and then get them to connect and talk. So we have the meters in place. Now we're getting the rest of the software in place to be able to do all that um, talking, calculating, working together. I don't exactly. I was just texting somebody right now. Hey, do you know when it's going to be ready? <laughs> and and um, I, I didn't get that text out yet. But um, I would, I'm curious, too, how soon that's going to be. I, I don't think it's going to be a whole lot longer, but that is one of our goals to make that an operational item so that it will indeed. That's one of the reasons why we got these smart meters, because we want that capability. It's going to tell us so much more other than just, hey, their power's out. It's going to tell us how accurate all of our infrastructure and GIS is. It's going to tell us this customer is on this wire, but, oh, we thought they were on that wire. It's literally going to tell us a whole lot more than just outage information. But um, we just need to finish getting all the pieces. So it's connected. probably in less than two years if it's a That's question. what our goal is, I would think. Um, have I got the confirmation back yet? No, I don't. But that would be an ideal goal, I think, to, to make that happen. You know, we want to be able to, to do so that. Regardless of whether you're underground or, or, or above ground. It won't matter. It it's won't all matter. Good. You'll tell where it is. And so, so you're not necessarily protected by being underground because that could be a bigger problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. So. I'll go ahead and let somebody else ask, ask a question. Okay. okay. Thank you. Do you have any questions, additional questions? No, I already asked most of my questions. Okay. okay. I have a couple. Um, so when I was reading the report, uh, on page five it mentioned two things. Um, the radial feed to downtown... Um, I guess the old report had recommended making this a loop system to be improved, to get improved reliability. And your response is we, that we would consider this feeder to be looped because it's tied to other feeders. The branch lines are radial, which is consistent with our tariff. Looping of branch lines typically requires contribution from the customer. I guess my question to you is, If it is more reliable, why wouldn't you go ahead and do it? Why would the customer have to pay for us to pay for that to be done? I can, I can take that. Microphone, please. Thank you. Um, our, our obligation when we do line extension work or to, to serve our customers is to do it at the most cost-effective manner. Yeah, and I know. Taking into consideration also the, uh, um, you know, the reliability aspect of it. So for that overhead, for us to be able to do that interconnecting to make that happen um, would not be cost effective. 
we have to collect that extra above and beyond. We even do that for looping too. Like if you are a commercial customer and you need a transformer for your place, our standard is looping. You get that first wire that runs from the line over to the transformer, that's included. But the one that runs back for the loop on underground, you're paying that cost. So um, we do collect that from the commercial customers. Anything that is above the minimum needed to get power per our tariff, we are, are but that's, to collect. I get that, but this, is, this isn't new. This is existing service. Yeah. And it looks to me like the old report was saying that it was problematic. Now, I, I, granted, that was 20 years ago. Because what it said was the downtown area is, I'm not going to say this word right, radially served mm -hmm. and should be looped to improve the liability or the reliability. Includes Honey Lane um, and Broadway from Scotland to Monroe. Oh, I think the smart grid is going to take care of that because um, from what I'm understanding, we're, we're going to be put, tying all those feeders together so it will no longer be radio fed anymore, at least at the feeder level. Okay, because it doesn't say that. Yeah. It, what it's saying is if you want it done, the customer has to pay. That, and that's, that's why I'm asking yeah, the question. I think that we're looking specifically at the neighborhood lines, like if you have a line running down your street and it dead ends, that would be a radio line in your neighborhood. And if you want that to be a looped line, then we would have to run another line down there and connect it up. And that would be a, a premium cost as per our regulations. Well, how is a smart thing going to solve this? It's going to solve it on at the feeder level, at the bigger level. And you've mentioned specifically downtown. Well, well that's what this says, radial feed to downtown. Yeah, I believe um, we're going to have yeah, more. We, uh, <laughs> well, this question came up during the development of the report is what, what does this really mean? And... The feeder that that one Go that one. Here if you want, if, I mean, <laughs> chime in, Mo. I'm not going to answer because we had the same question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We did. Yeah. So. so the feeder, the way it was described in the old report, that this is a radial feed and this is it's a vulnerability. We've got that feeder tied. So when we tie feeders together, that's the vert. That's looping. It's just a different terminology. So at the feeder level, we tie them together. At the lateral level, we loop them. So when it said in the old report that this is radially fed and it's vulnerable. Well, we, we've got that feeder tied together and I, you know, I can't say when exactly that happened since the very old report till now, but you, we could say it's looped. I mean, that's the wrong terminology for Duke, but the feeder is now tied together. So if there was a sense that that was vulnerable, that's not the case now. It's a feeder tied together. Are you, are you and you satisfied with that answer? Yeah. Yeah, Mayor, and I'll, I'll try to clarify it. Going back to what Jorge mentioned earlier about a sewer system or, or water system going to the end of the, the street. From Duke's perspective, you've, if you've got one you know, pipe going to the house at the end of the street, that would be a, um, a radial, radial feed. In other words, if something happens, we don't have another way to uh, immediately reroute um, power to that. Uh, with these um, feeders being tied together, if you have a feeder outage uh, that's on, you know, serving downtown, we have another option to route power to that uh, line. So, you know, from the perspective of the customers, you know, they do have an alternate source of, of a supply. So that's why we would consider it to be, you know, based on the terminology in there, we would, we would consider that okay. uh, looped. So you two are satisfied yeah. with the yes. answer? Yes, and I will say, I mean, this got beat on. Okay, well, that's why time. I'm asking. And Will, I'm, unfortunately, Will's not here, but and because Will just, you know, he, yeah, okay. he, he beat I just, on. I so, mean. Yeah. But it's, it's a great question. Yeah. And, um, and again, I think the whole issue of the alternate thing, that's where the healing will come in, because if, if there's an outage, then it goes to the other way that you can get the, the, okay. the energy. All right, on the same page, you talk about transformer inspections. Um, and you, t you talk about the overhead transformers that are mounted to the poles, and you say there is no formal inspection process for these transformers, that your crews inspect them during their usual time in the field. Well, that's worrisome if there's no formal inspection process. So talk to me about that. Because I believe in my instance, 
the outage that I had, I think it was a bad transformer. And I had been having outages for years and, and somehow just thought that was normal until when I complained to Jeff about it, they fixed it. And I, I, I have some shut off things that normally happen, but that's it. So it, how, how do you inspect it and how often? I mean, you have to have some time frame to inspect these things, right? Well, the reason there's not a formal one is because our crews are out there uh, constantly, and it's, it'd be more cumbersome to develop a, a formal inspection program to look at stuff that we're driving by and up in buckets all the time. So that when we say there's not a formal one, it's already an, an expectation of our crews while they're out there to be looking at our transformers, to be looking at anything that could be uh, potentially in need of repair. But to create a formal program around that, you're just creating some almost like adding more bureaucracy into what we're doing. The the underground pad mounted transformers, that requires us to take a look at and so Right, and that's that that's, that's why I'm detailed. asking because you have out in twenty twenty two it says a new inspection program for the surface mounted equipment um, on a five year inspection cycle, but you have no inspection cycle for the transformers and that's concerning to me. Okay. And well we put that in there out of transparency that there is no formal program, but again, with them up in the air and attached to the poles, it's the inspection, it's an expectation of all our crews to be able to look at those, and if there's any need of repair, that they report it in or they take action. Okay, I'm just gonna say I'm, I'm very concerned about that. So as you're, as you're working through your negotiations with our agreement, I, I just, I'm very concerned with that. May I, may I Mayor, if that? I, if sure. I, so on the on the trans, uh, I like I said, I had we're done with my big questions, and I got a couple of little ones, and that's one of them, because we have uh, occasionally we will lose a transformer off the pole mm -hmm. in our neighborhood, but um, I don't know why we lose it. Uh, there's transformers traditionally uh, in great shape forever, un unless they take the hit, unless they get a hit, because everybody always says, oh, we heard a pop. I don't know where that pop came from. Did it come from lightning or did it come, what, what caused it? So does a transmitter have, a, like for example, moving parts that would have to be adjusted or checked? Or does a transformer normally last almost forever unless it takes a shot? That, yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. For the transformers themselves, they rarely have any issues. Um, and that's one of the reasons we don't have an inspection thing. So when you have a failure, it's usually not the transformer. Usually it was an animal that got on a line and that what you're hearing pop, we have a fuse on that transformer that protects overload, it protects things of power surge from getting to your home or blowing up the transformer. So when that was happening is just like the breaker in your home, you had overloaded something inside, the breaker tripped. That's what you're hearing in essence is a giant breaker tripping out there on the transformer because there is a, a fault sensed. The transformer is still fine the, in, the number of times that we actually go out and have to replace a bad transformer due to an outage is very, very small. And there is no, um, one of the reasons why there's no particular inspection program, I mean, you can drive by them and you can uh, and see if there's any potential issue that would look like it would be causing it to fail in the near future. But as far as anything else, there's not really a particular um, tell, I guess you can say. Um, you know, there's not something that's going to say this transformer is going to fail in a year or four years or five years. It's just they, they just generally work. Just like the breakers in your home, it's not going to do anything. It's just going to keep doing what it does until it doesn't. Um, but what I would assume, yeah. and again, not trying to tell you how to run your business, but I would assume when you're doing your tree trimming every three years or whatever that you would be inspecting and well, marking off on something that you've inspected it. We, whenever, to the point they brought up before, any time that we do any work anywhere, we always observe all of our equipment on the pole. That includes transformers, the ground lines, the arresters, our insulators, everything. And if we see anything bad when we're out there doing our work, then we put in for that to get repaired at the same time we're doing any other work. Um, also wanted to mention too, you mentioned we do have an inspection for the pad mount transformers. That's what it says here. Right, and that's true, we do. Um, biggest point being difference, when you have equipment on the ground like that, it rusts. Um, you end up with things that happen when it's on the ground that you wouldn't when it's in the air. 
um, that constant water contact is a bit of a issue. So we do end up doing proactive checks on that because you just can't have oil leaking into the ground. Um, we well, and I get it. I, I understand what you're saying, but I, it's, it's concerning to me. Yeah, and so. I mean, at, at the risk of, of putting my foot in my mouth, I would compare it to something. If the city had, um, I would imagine you have an inspection program for water lines, but you may not have an inspection program for sidewalks because sidewalks are easily viewable. And, but maybe you do, so I could just put my foot in my mouth. But, <laughs> But that's that's kind of like a, a a good comparison sidewalks or or something that's easily visible by city staff and and your public works folks. It might be more cumbersome to go through and have a constant checklist. That that that'd be a, a reasonable analogy to what we're doing. Mayor, if I could, um, when we did meet and discuss this particular topic at at length, um, I know from my perspective, being in kind of an asset management geek. And having done that for the better part of my career, um, you know, we, we had a different uh, approach, I guess, to, to their business model as to what we would do. Um, and after a lengthy discussions, we kind of respected that and let them conduct business, I guess, the way they, they feel they should. But it's not necessarily the practice that we would follow. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, okay. Uh, Um, there's a couple of things that I uh, want to ask, uh, things of our staff. So we have right-of-way agreements with these utilities, right? That's what they pay, pay us for, right? Correct. The various utilities. Easement agreements and rights-of-way yeah. agreements, yeah. And I know you can't answer this now, but and I don't even know if it's legally allowed, but it seems to me that we should try to negotiate that if one utility needs to move, the one that it's attached to, that they're required to go to. Is, I mean, is that even an, a consideration or an option? Actually, I, I can speak to it a little bit. I believe Chris Rowe with BMO's Tallahassee office is on is on the line. To see if you want um, to because we've but had. Do you understand what I'm trying to get at? Yeah, okay, you're talking totally. about on you're both talking ends, about it just okay. feels like we need to we need help. We need help, and we need to force yeah. it. I don't know how to do that the right way. And again, I'm not trying to solve it today, but. Yeah, but specific to the question, uh, you know, having reviewed the, the draft franchise agreement um, that Duke provided <clears throat> and uh, having gone over it here recently um, with Chris Rowe, um, there were some conversations re regarding the annual permit uh, that is referenced in, in the franchise agreement. And I think to, to your comment, the mayor is, and, and Chris can hopefully, I know enough to be dangerous here, so I'll let him chime in at, at some point. but. Um, with respect to those other utility providers, um, we have franchise agreements with Duke. We have one with Clearwater Gas. The other uh, utility service providers, uh, Frontier, um, Spectrum, and, and others, um, there was a change in the legislature, and, and so we, we no longer have franchise agreements with them. That's dictated by the PSC, I believe. But I'll let Chris Rowe uh, chime in because some of that is where they're restricted, I believe, in forcing somebody to get off their poll once they've vacated the poll. So, Chris, if you could elaborate. You should be able to unmute yourself, Chris. I, th this is Chris. Are you Perfect. able to hear me? Yep. Thanks. It's so, so there is a uh, city code provision, I believe it's uh, 58715, that requires utility providers to seek an annual uh, permit for operations in the city. Mayor, are you able to hear me? Yeah, I, I can hear you. Okay. So the, the, the city code requires uh, your utility providers to seek an annual uh, permit for operations in the city. The agreement with uh, Duke originally and, and the new franchise agreement that's been presented has a, has a carve out for Duke that basically says they won't be required to uh, apply for, obtain, or, or pay for uh, permits. And so that is a, an item of discussion that um, uh, Jorge and I have um, gone over uh, whether or not we need to address that directly in the franchise agreement and basically eliminate that text so that uh, Duke remains subject to that city code provision. It's my understanding that, that Duke has complied with that 
uh, to date, uh, although they, um, uh, the, the original franchise agreement did include an exception to, for, from that. So Chris, I, I think the mayor's question was specific to other utilities that might be on uh, a Duke pole, and if they um, subsequently go underground, um, the ability for either Duke or the city to require those other utilities that are still hanging on that pole to be removed. Or to be, or to be relocated, Chris. So the, the, that, that is um, and, and maybe a function of the other agreements with the other utility providers. Is it cl Clearwater Gas and one other? But, that was but my question. Apparently, yeah, I mean, that's uh, the part in, that in the case of cable, cable and telecom, they've been, the, the, there's no longer a need to have an agreement. Gotcha. To what you mentioned, there are, there are probably some specifics to navigate there with those specific agreements. And there's actually a statute to require on the limitations that we can require right, for I, relocation. I mm hmm so we can, we can dial into those and provide a summary, okay. Mayor. Yeah, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Because I, I just think we have to look at it, try no, to solve it if we can, one. you know, one way or another. And maybe it's multiple things we have to do to get it to coordinate. But whatever we can do to alleviate the, the um, business of undergrounding properly, you know, we want to... Um, <clears throat> I have some other questions asks and questions, but I, I want to give other people. So do you have any more questions? I don't have any more questions. questions. Just comments. John, do you have any more questions? Um, I, I was going to follow through on that on that transformer, just in case somebody is listening to this. And so very, very quickly, so who does, how do you reset that transformer if it's been kicked off? Does that, can you do that through the smart system or through the? In, in most cases, uh, you know, as, uh, Bob was alluded to, it's because the fuse has blown. That's what you're actually hearing when you hear the bang, that is okay. the fuse. Unfortunately, the fuse cannot be okay. um, repaired without sitting in a truck. But the good news is, historically, anybody downstream would be out of power. Now, with the smart system, only those in the immediate, you know, served by that transformer will be out because now, um, you know, we have the ability um, and with undergrounding, we still have that transformer. Yes, yeah, it's, it's the same mechanisms of working, but yeah. So, thank you. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, we still have to roll a truck for that. Thank today. you. I'm, I'm fine. I'm done. You good? And I, I don't think you didn't have any more questions, I, right? I had two. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, on. Okay, let's go back to underground. You know, that's my favorite topic. Um, and this is almost a question for the city. It's a question for y'all too. And that is, how much does the city, how, how much are, is the city tied in to undergrounding uh, as some sort of requirement to d all development, both residential projects, multi-residential, and complex multi-use? Because, you know, that is something we can do at this level. So I, I'm just throwing that out there. But that's my question. So we don't require undergrounding. Yeah, and is, that could be a real issue. Right. Well, with respect to the land development code for new subdivisions, granted, we, we don't have that much vacant land left in the city, but for new subdivisions, um, typically during the infrastructure review process, we do request and, and most often the developer complies with undergrounding utilities because one, it's, it's a selling point for that particular subdivision. So on new subdivisions, most likely, almost all the time, the, the utilities are undergrounded as a part of that development process. But we have condominium projects. That's not pure, pure you know, residential subdivisions. Why can't we require it there? And, and what Jorge is saying is that the new ones that are going in, those would be undergrounded. The infill development is, is what I'm concerned about more in terms of, because then we'd have the you know, pole going up and then down and underground and that type of a thing. So we can certainly look into it. You know, Deborah, could I just make one comment? Um, you know, the other piece of that is, you know, I did it in 2004. I did a, a remodel of my house, and I had the line going from my house to the backyard line. And I think at that time it cost $800. And so I think it's also creating awareness. And I'll tell you, I look at that every day, and I'm like, thank God I did that. But you, because you have your moment. You do it when you're doing all the other stuff. But I think, too, I don't know how we try to create awareness when people are doing those types of things you know, take the, take the opportunity to, to put a line underneath because any line underneath just 
I mean, it just aesthetically looks so much better, and it's... And, and, and I still, you know, thank you all very much for saying undergrounding has its issues, too. However, I would rather, you know, say, well, I'm going to have very good service most of the time, and if there's an issue, it's going to take longer, instead of I never know when I'm going to have good service, you know, with overhead. So, you know, that's debatable, but, you know, I... But to your point, Commissioner Kynes, um, the city of Clearwater, um, I'm not saying their ordinance is the perfect ordinance or whatever, but they do have an undergrounding uh, ordinance in place that I believe, again, ordinances aren't my expertise, uh, I believe that it does address the issue of like remodels and things of that nature. So, um, And that's I, maybe... I, 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 I'm, ass that I'm assuming that would be easy not. for you to pull, but if not, I can get someone from our team and to... I would really appreciate it. Yeah, I can uh, get, because I know the city of Clearwater does have that a, a pretty... It's, it sounds like the ordinance that I'm hearing you saying that you would like to consider. I would like to... to uh, study it definitely and you know I thought you're you know on net zeroing okay I did a CLE course and the bottom line from what you said you you intimated that it's always an environmental rather than a financial and I would debate that because I think people do say I'm going to do solar and I'm going to cut my bills. And I, I think that's, you know, I think they're inextricably woven. So here's the question. When you have enough solar, so right, you're saying now there's a small pool that want to sell their thing to you. And therefore, you can produce it at this cost, so why should you pay them a higher cost? But at some point, solar may be a bigger, much bigger producer than electric at some point i'm not saying i'm saying 20 30 i don't know i'm you know i i'm not the wizard of oz but at some point that economics are going to stabilize is that true or false well i, mean, I can't say with because again i'm not a solar expert so i can't say true but but what you're saying intellectually sounds true because if you think about it it's one of those things where um what, in my opinion, is going to be the real game changer is, is not solar, it's battery storage. Because right now, today, you know, you can have all the solar in the world. Let's say you were completely disconnected from the grid. You can have all the solar in the world, but at 9 p.m. tonight, you're not going to have any power um, because you don't have a way to store it. Oh, one, okay. Yeah, I got so, you. Yeah, so, so it's one, storage, so it's, it's storage is the issue. The solar. But solar costs have dropped dramatically. Um, I mean, that's why you know, at Duke, you know, we, we have, um, I mean, I don't know the exact number of solar panels that we're at today, but we're approaching about 3 million solar panels. You go back five years ago, I, I don't know what the number was, but it was very, very small. So, you know, utility scale solar uh, is being developed all over the country. So uh, because their price parity has become relatively close with other generating sources. And that's what I'm yeah. going to say. But, it, it, but then even like talking about different fuel sources, you know, just last week, Duke announced that by 2030, does anybody recall the exact percentage? But we are, you know, cause we still, especially in the Midwest, we have a lot of coal-fired uh, generation still today. Uh, by 2030, I want to say we're cutting that to 5%. Uh, by 2035, we will no longer have any coal facilities. Uh, in the state of Florida, I would say we're ahead of the game uh, in terms of coal because we are down to one site in Florida, um, and we have been at one site for at least five years because we've retired. Mo we, you know, we've we've been aggressively retiring coal plants in Florida for many years, but yeah, as you know, battery storage will be the, the game changer, and that that's what I always say. The the, the thing about solar that is a, a little bit you know, misunderstood is that, you know, for example, I'll use last week as the perfect example. We are a winter peaking utility, and that surprises most people. And what I mean by that is at a single point in time, the demand from our customers is higher in the winter than it is on a July day. And to put it in perspective, and, and like I said, the reason, think about it this way. We all get up on those 38 degree mornings. We get up, we turn on the heat, jump in the shower, um, 
turn on blow dryers, turn on coffee pots. So from just a, at, a, at that instant in time, our demand can, can jump to as high as 13,000 megawatts. On a standard July-August afternoon where it's 94 degrees and 100% humidity, our demand is usually running in the seven to 8,000 megawatt range. The reason for that is the mayor has her air conditioner on, uh, you have your air conditioner on, but yours is going on and yours is going off and this one's going on and you know, it's just one thing. So, so it's a very balanced load. If you look at it like on a, 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 a four hour cycle or whatever, it's pretty much a straight line of demand. But on cold days, you know, it's, you're gonna see spikes that are just incredible. And those typically happen at 7 a.m. in the morning. And so that's why I always tell people that, you know, it will be a challenge to get uh, completely off of some base load fuel because, um, you know, at 7 o'clock in the morning, you're not getting any solar. And, again, so unless the battery, um, yeah. and it will, I mean, the cost of batteries will go down. I mean, we're... Um, you know, at, at Duke, you know, we, we have been, in fact, up until just recently, we had the largest battery um, in the United States. It's in, uh, uh, I believe, No Trees, Texas. There's someone has just built, built a larger one. Um, but, you know, so we're, we're doing battery technology. Uh, we have a project coming online um, at John Hopkins Middle School in St. Petersburg, which happens to be a special needs shelter. But just to put in perspective the cost of battery storage today, um, now we will be using that battery to balance our grid and everything in that area during the year. But again, the primary purpose is that for that special needs shelter to be able to run, you know, for, you know, hopefully we don't have another week outage, but if we do, um, that battery alone is $20 million. So again, that's what I'm saying. It's, we're still, in, in my opinion, where battery storage is the game changer in the energy industry. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have about seven minutes before we have to wrap this up. So I had, I'm not going to ask questions. I'm just going to tell you guys, because I, I know that you all are, in the process of negotiation on our agreement. And there's a couple of things I'd like you all, and I think we would all like to see in, as a part of that discussion. Um, our decorative light poles, we've been limited on those light poles as to what they can be. And, um, you know, they're coming out with smart poles and all different kinds of things, and so would like to have the ability to have, I mean, those light poles that we have right now are, are and Bob will tell you, they're rather, you know, inexpensive, and we can't hang anything on them, like flowers or anything. You know, there's a whole number of myriad of things we've wanted to do with those light poles that we can't because we're limited. Mm -hmm. So would like to see that improved. Um, charging stations. There was discussion about the rebate program, whatever that is. I mean, we need some charge, more charging stations. We need to understand if there are charging stations that can accommodate golf carts and how that all works. We've got a garage we're going to talk about building. You know, we need a bunch in the downtown is what I'm saying. So whatever, whatever kind of deal you can work out there. Um, the substation, I think that's on San Christopher, right? Mm -hmm. Is there anything we can do to improve it aesthetically? It's pretty damn ugly. <laughs> Whether it's a white fence or something, I mean, plants, something. It, it's pretty ugly. Um, you know, right in the middle of a neighborhood. Um, That's pretty much it, I think, for me, anyway. I don't mm -hmm. know if you all have anything that you want to add to that. But, uh, um, Mo, I appreciate all the work you've done yeah, you know, we'll on this. Have a couple and and I know you're going to keep working to get our agreement the best it can be, and um, we appreciate that.
Want to make a couple comments? Sure, sure please. Yeah, um, you know, it's been, um, you know, almost a year process. Um, and the goal from the beginning for the whole commission, the goal um, that became our goal in the meetings was uh, getting a Dunedin-specific overview of the state of our electrical energy system. And um, I have to say, after the first really tough meeting, um, where all the all the players were there for that first meeting, um, you know, Duke got engaged. And uh, I, I thank all of you that are here. I especially thank Chris, uh, because Chris, you know, got into my kindergarten head to try to say, hey, how do we make this understandable and Dunedin specific? And of course, Jeff, thank you to you as well. And uh, Mike was a lot of those meetings. And Bob, you've had a lot of great things today and other two gentlemen that are here. Um, I think a lot of it was to get out a lot of pent up frustration. And um, you did, especially in the first meeting, take a lot of that hit. Um, and but then came back as professionals to say how can we kind of do what this commission is asking us to do um, so it's about resetting our relationship which I feel like you know for me and, and I know you haven't had the kind of interactions but I think um, this was all about resetting the relationship and um, and then we can move forward I think uh, what I've learned from it Duke's made a lot of improvements specifically related to Dunedin since Irma uh, which had you know really probably you know is the the dynamite that really exploded a lot of issues. Um, you're continuing to do that. Um, I personally, as part of this process, as we've moved along, reached out to some of the citizens that were screaming at me as late as, you know, pandemic and things going out. And, you know, the word I got from the ones that I talked to were so much improved, so much improved, so, so positive. Self-healing is a good thing. Um, again, I continue to, to ask our citizens to reach out if there's problem areas, not just to, to uh, do, but to us, so we can continue to build the relationship and, you know, and, and do the best we can for our citizens. Um, um, definitely, um, you know, there's more work to be done, and, and we're going to continue to challenge. Um, we have been able to do some things in past franchise agreements. Um, it doesn't always have to be part of the agreement. It can be kind of sitting on the side of the agreement, but things that are priorities of us. And I know that the mayor brought up a couple of them, my personal. The decorative lighting is a really personal one of mine, but um, and the ability to do some, some things in our main areas. Is that but, my cutoff alarm? <laughs> yeah, there it is. That's your cutoff. But anyway, I, again, I just, and I want to I wanna thank uh, staff because, um, you know, Jorge and Keith and Will, uh, and Paul was in some of those as well. Uh, you know, thanks for all the work because we had many, many meetings. So, and Zoom calls. Any final comments, Commissioner Torngo? No, I, yeah, I would just like hope that we can stay on top of that smart stuff, uh, and and hopefully hear more back as it relates specifically to Dunedin and how that is affecting us. So, I think that's I I think from what I've heard that's that's a a, a major a major player in this all of this. Is that correct? I think, yes. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Final comments? Yes. Um, you know, I, I just want to say, and I, I do thank all of you all here. I thank all of our staff and, and Commissioner Franey that have worked so hard on this project. Um, but, you know, I, I was thinking about it. I was ranting over eight days, and I'm, I thought to myself, that is not empathetic to people that went through, um, you know, Katrina and the Ninth Ward, and I've read books on it. I mean, so I'm not meaning to be non-empathetic. People have it so much worse, and you look at the tornadoes and the, you know, that are up in the Midwest, and you, you look at, um, you know, fires in California, and, but I, I do believe that we're gonna continue to see this volatility and we all have to be ready for that volatility, whether it's hurricanes, tornadoes, flood, a peril of flood, you know, fire, whatever. And it's really gonna take us all working together because the grid is gonna change, you know it. And with, with the whole new net zero, the whole thing, the new changes. So it really is on a much broader scale it's going to take every one of us in a, almost a public-private partnership to work on this because we were, are going to continue to see it, this volatility in climate change. Thank you. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for, let's see, five years it took. <laughs> 
to get to this point, so I appreciate it. Um, but I think I think you guys have heard what we've had to say in addition to finding the Clearwater Ordinance and um, look for ways to require other utilities to move when we need it to be moved or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you guys will talk about that and keep us informed. Yeah, okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate yeah, real, it. Real quick, I was just going to say, we, I'm assuming y'all are active in Amer the Florida League of Cities. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I know joint use is a pain point, and that's a kind word for uh, for me to say about joint use. So if there is anything that we can help, I, guess I don't know. I have to believe that with as many cities we have in Florida that this issue has come up before um, because you know, I, I feel very confident that we would support you know, you know, know what you're talking about because it would make our life easier as well. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris. All right. We got a couple uh, things. All right. We have uh, the commission discussion. We have, to my knowledge, we have three items. Um, so, Commissioner or Vice Mayor Kynes, you have an item? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, it was uh, just brought to me actually yesterday, and um, it is a gentleman that uh, lives in the historic African-American uh, Dunedin neighborhood, and he was, he is very interested in working with all, with all the neighbors. Um, what you're going to see before you is a, I think we call them Grand Oaks. And this is uh, a historic meeting site for the African-American community. Uh, Vinny actually sent the gentleman to me. And um, we do need to do a lot more research. Uh, we thought perhaps if we could, if, if it comes to fruition, a historic marker, perhaps we could do it on Juneteenth, which would be in the, the uh, historic African-American um, community. And um, Jennifer just asked me, to, you know, before um, our staff spends more time on it because we have to do more historical research, uh, we'll be working with the History Museum. We'll be working with United, um, which is our basically our diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, committee. So I just really need uh, your thoughts or approval on the ability to go forward to continue to look at this project. Doesn't the historical committee do this? Well, this is, depending on all the research and how it goes forward, this is how it would go. United, or the DEI, would probably bring it to HPAC. The HPAC then would probably be the decider. It would also be the funder of the historic plaque. See, we have funding right. for the historic plaque. So that's how it would run, It depending again, because we still need more history and data. But I do want to mention this. Uh, a man is Fred Lewis that brought this forward. Very, very uh, involved and interested in this community um so again it's just right now i'm asking your approval to pursue jennifer you have any issues with it i don't know okay sounds good to me yeah, okay I mean, john you okay <clears throat> no problem at all all righty thank you okay was i correct and you had something i have something okay yeah go ahead. Well, the, the main thing that I have is that I've been uh, notified by the chamber that, um, of course, we're scheduled and we've talked about the dates for the Toronto Blue Jays game. Um, you know, hopefully baseball by the time June comes. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen with spring training, of course. But as far as um, the, the trip that the chamber takes to Toronto, uh, they need to understand who of all of us is going to go. Um, I, I bring this up because I don't know where else to bring it up. We can we can deal with that, but of course, in you know, historically the funding has been different, so I don't know how that will work. But they do need to know because they have a limited number of people that can go, and and obviously they're giving us priority, 
so they need to know so that they can determine who else can go so I don't know how we want to move forward on that Jennifer but well um, we have an annual it's supposed to be on an annual agenda so now that you've reminded us okay cool let's do our that's in our rules and regs or whatever we'll add it to the agenda and everybody can think about what would you like to see do you have a preference what do you mean what would I like to see? well I mean anybody have a preference of whether it's a single person or multiple people or um, I don't I don't have a preference either way I right fully right. intend to go as the yeah. uh, as the city's liaison um, but uh, other than that it, it it's up to everyone okay. else individually so we will we will put together um, and I'm sure you'll understand who from staff might go right right yeah. so okay. we could do that actually um, the second meeting then the second Tuesday in March would that be enough time you want to do it? Mm. Well, you can talk to you can talk to the chamber yeah. because they seem pretty anxious to find out, so that they can get other people thinking and know how many spots they have. We can get it. We can put it on for the eighth. Um, but you've already you're about to approve the agenda for the eighth. No, we already approved. We did approve. We already it, approved it. So wait. Right. We oh, I it. see. Yeah, already. It should be on a. We could put it on a. That should be on a Tuesday meeting. Yeah. Whatever yeah, the first Tuesday so. is. Put an action item on the eighth then. Yeah, and other than that, I mean, I don't have anything else. Obviously, okay. I don't have any knowledge of what's going to happen with spring training. I, Greater I do, people than I me. I just ask, what, what, where are we on the lockdown or whatever it's? Uh, you know. No lockdown. It's, yeah. I just, actually, I just got a, a text message from okay. Vince, which I misread and thought that the lockdown was, was over with, and I was all happy. Lock out. Read it. Lock out. Lock out. Lockdown. Lock out. Lock out. It's like, lock out. It's, it's they're still lockdown. locked out. They're mm -hmm. still locked down. Yeah. It's not the lockdown. No, it's yeah, not okay. the lockdown. It's locked well, I want to be sure and get that right. Well, things did not go well on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And um, union was, union players, union was underwhelmed by the owner's mm -hmm. offer. And so it's, it's not expected to, you know, it's not getting better. Let's put it that way. And so, I mean, can I just ask, so, so, and so what, how, what, I guess we, I can ask you to look into a crystal ball. If it's not resolved by a certain time, how will it affect our spring training? Well, I well, think it I, already has. Right? Yeah, I think right now, in my personal opinion, again, um, you know, I'm the liaison, but I'm not an expert on this. I, I think it absolutely is going to affect us. The question is how deep will we get any of the spring training? Will we get part of the spring training? I don't know. I have personally, on purpose, not called Mark Shapiro on this until after Thursday night's Blue Jay Hotel item. I just mm -hmm. didn't want to have anything on record that I'm talking to Blue Jays until that's determined. Um, but after that, I'll call him. But again, you've talked to him, Jennifer, and I know that, again, he's in the middle of it, so there's only so much he can say. Okay, I mean, maybe I shouldn't have asked, but. No, you can ask. You know, so okay, thank you. Just continue to be hopeful. Okay. John, did you have any commission discussion? Um, no, I'm fine for it. Okay. All right. Well, y'all got my very long email. Apologize for that. Um, but it was in regards to just trying to keep our meetings flowing in a good order um, and being able to get done on time. Um, so I don't want to go through this word by word. You, you saw what I've suggested. I did, and I need to pull it up because I meant to have it copied or um, printed for me. Regarding the charter official updates, are you guys all okay with that? Just letting me know when you've got an update? Yes. Okay. Mayor, can, can we just, I just want to find it first so I'm tracking with you. It came directly from you, right? Yep. Come on, Mo. We're trying I'm trying. Oh, there we go. Colleagues. Colleagues. Okay, see more. There we go. Okay, I got it. Thank you very much for waiting. No problem. So the charter official updates, you guys are all okay with that. Okay. Um, and then the commission discussion where we just shoot everybody an email that you've got something to, add, you know, to talk about. That way I can, like today I was able to say, okay, 12 o'clock, I'm stopping this conversation so we have enough time. For people to talk you know so everybody okay with that nikki you don't have any sunshine law as long as nobody's replying all or anything right you were 
you guys cannot, yeah, you guys you can't communicate, but you can send, you can do one way emails. Send you can send information through. I mean, yes. But I mean, it's it's only information if you say I will have a topic. Hello. And well, that's what you did. Talk. I mean, and you can do that, but I think in some cases. When it's something that's really going to be thought provoking, asked to please let I mean I, to to at least let the clerk know, and then she would indicate it on the agenda. That's how I thought the communication was going to occur. Except that, well, then that you, you're really going to want people to know way too far ahead of time. I mean, that's the gender of the cheat sheet. Uh, oh, that's sorry, the cheat yeah, sheet. Yeah, that's what I thought you meant. You mentioned sorry. that it would then yes. be noted on. Your I don't cheat see sheet. the cheat sheet until I walk okay. in the door. Okay. Well, so, so that I, doesn't, I don't want to have to see it and review it before I get here. I'm just trying to think of that way that was very clear that there's nothing, there's no communication going on about what the item is or that an item is, is requested. I mean, it yeah. doesn't say what the topic's on. It could, you know, it's nothing. Okay, it's, well then that's a problem. Because what we've been talking about is when it comes up, when certain conversations, and I, I don't have an example for you, but when you don't know it's coming, you haven't had a chance to think about it, um, and they bring it up, and it's like, well, nobody can answer the question. Well, but I, um, so I think that I thought, so that part I thought was directed more toward people who are not on the board. So if you have a question for legal, rather than asking the question in discussion, call me and say I've got I have this question I'm going to bring up, so I'm prepared. I didn't take that as making you know. The time for commission discussion, as I understood, was the time for you all to bring up. None of you have heard this before. I want to put this on a future okay, agenda. Okay, so if you want to leave it at just topic, that's fine. It I just, mean, I, I think that's the only way to do it, Mayor, without you all otherwise, you well, know. I just sent out this email and you didn't say anything about it. Oh, no, I think the email, I thought the email, the, and that was why I was saying the way I read the substantive items would still be discussed for the first time at the meeting. Yes. Um, if, well, that's what I'm saying for everybody else to do. Yeah, yes. But so you are okay with putting the subject on there? Just the subject. No, no. See, I get what she's saying. We're, we're giving you a heads up. I've got a topic. And right, I'm about ready to come over there and... Okay. Because I'm telling you, I've, we've been, we operated under these rules before. Okay, the... Question is, and I the way that I read your email from yesterday was Forget that, what my email said. Okay. What I'm saying is I sent an email with a lot of information in it. Mm -hmm. You didn't have a problem with that, right? And no one replied to it. Nobody to no one replied to it. No. Right. That's now my, we're talking about it. That but yeah. exactly. So that's my point. Right. If somebody has a commission discussion item to give us a heads up and to give us a heads up on what it is, nobody replies all. So that people have a little chance to think about it. I just said I. I think that the the this is an example where the maybe the the devil is in the details. And yes, you know, one way communications can occur so that people have background and information. But in terms of doing that routinely, then there does become some. So we okay. we want to make sure that it that the discussion is occurring here. And, and I don't. I only bring that up because when I read over the rules, I read commission disc items to bring, it says on the agenda, to bring forward for future discussion. So no one should be bringing a discussion item expecting that everyone that else then has vetted it and researched it and come together with an opinion. The, the way that it reads even on the agenda is that it's to bring something up that then you want to schedule gotcha. for a future discussion. Okay. So right. I, want, I hope that helps to take the pressure off too, that just because an item is brought forth, it's, it's really to bring an item for, to say, I want to make this a future discussion because you all can't talk to right, one another right. okay. in between. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. It does. So, but, thank you. I'm glad we uh, had. We're yeah. Still going to send the email to to say there's going. I have an. I, item. Have, a yeah, I, I, have, I a have a topic. Yeah. I have a topic. Because I think understanding what? that's the purpose that I asked for is that I have an understanding of how much time to get us out of here on time. And like you did today, you said I know we've got three. We've got three topics. Right. And, and I knew I wanted to cut off at twelve. To That's a good time, <laughs> no, know. I understand that. Well, you guys had a long discussion. You guys had a big workshop. Well, I knew that was going to be. Yeah. Okay. So but yes, is can... everybody okay with that? I think now with signaling that you're going to have a, a topic. A topic. And can we can we in general, unless emergent, limit to one topic per person per meeting? 
I don't think it's necessary that, I mean, you might have, to, I mean, I could have easily talked about an issue with Tampa Bay Regional Planning today. But I based, know, I have. Based on everything, I'm like, okay, I'm not, I'm just not going to do it. Um, I can do that via staff. Um, so to me, it's not necessarily the number. It's that I think sometimes, I, I have felt, and I'm sure I've done it too, um, that sometimes it, you know, an issue that's brought is just like long and involved and, and we're at being, and we're kind of, a, there's this expectation to make, you know, a consensus decision sometimes. So I just think it's, if you have a, an item that you want to put on the agenda, you know, a couple minutes of a description articulately done as to why that might be important to do versus, you know, trying to explain the whole issue. Right. You know, just enough to know whether it, it's of merit to all of us to put it on. Like what um, Commissioner Kynes just did. Vice yeah. Mayor. Sorry. But I mean, I think in general, it's fine. I mean, I don't, I don't typically have more than one topic. So, I mean, but I don't want to like, oh, well, that's why I said I don't want to dictate. Two, right? I'm just saying. No, and I appreciate If we can just your, keep it in our mind. Right, I say like, right. and sometimes there's going to be emergent time where you've got to cover a couple of things. But I just think it's helpful in keeping things moving. Yep. I'm good. Everybody else okay? Yep. All right. I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. I, I really fully understand this, but I, I understood how it worked before. We had we had commission discussion, and at that that's when we wanted it to bring something up. It might have been short and sweet, or it might have to go on a future agenda. And so I I wasn't worried about doing it here because I know I wasn't. There was no sunshine concern at all because I was doing it right out in the open. Um, your letter. I appreciate you asking her. It was my letter. Okay. Because your letter was quite, quite thorough about what the discussion was, and so for me, that was you know thank gosh nobody answered it in my opinion, okay, which I expect, assume nobody would, but to me that was a little bit more re revealing than what I th than what I thought would be comfortable for all of us. But I don't know, but I also think that there's times when I, we may want to bring something up, um, we didn't know about it until the day before, and now we want to bring it up. And we're not really quite sure what we want to say, so I don't know what the timing would uh, of that might be. Um, but I'm okay for somebody to bring it up here without me knowing about it, and we could say, well, we don't have a concern about it, so we don't, or we do. And so, uh, but I appreciate what you're trying, what you're trying to do, totally. Well, I think what she, what uh, she, Nikki is saying is that go ahead and send the email that says I have a topic. Just don't get an explanation okay. of it. Okay, right. good. So I, at the, good. for, You're just for to get my the purpose, volume. right? For my sole purpose, it's right. not to. It's volume. It's not it, substance. Exactly. It's, and it's making. It's sure just trying to understand what our timing is going to be because, you know, sometimes we can all have a topic, and then you've got a topic, Nikki, and you've got a topic, and you've got a topic. Now it's like, oh, we're never going to get out of here on time, or we're going to stop and not bring the things up that we really need to talk about. No, so. I think that that's exactly what, what I'm saying, Mayor. Thank yeah. you for gotcha. summarizing. And I do think that that's important to your job as presiding over the meetings is understanding the volume that you have to get through. And so, Mayor, does that, or Commissioner, does that help answer your question? Well, then I also want to make sure that Mo could, if, for example, Mo has something that's just come up, as I was saying, the day before, and she thinks it's important that I know about it, or that it's an issue that's going to come before us, she still needs to be able to bring it up if it's two or three things. Uh, I would want her to be able to do that. I would want it, just I'm using yeah. you just as right. an example. Sure. Any one of us. So. Well, not I don't. This is more the mayor, but I think what she's sure. saying as long as there's time, that's fine. But this, if we know about if you if you know ahead of time, then help you can manage. Well, the and volume. then I'll be able to see if there is a problem. Right. And we'll have to figure out how to address it. If I walk in the door to the meeting, like okay. today, I said, we're going to try to shut this down by noon. <laughs> I can say to everybody, right. look, we have this many items under informational updates. So we either have to cut short or can anybody remove the number of items they're going to, you know, You're right, lower. Not time sensitive right. or things like but that. But that, that's just, it's just about communication, right. really. It's not about judgment or anything else. Cool. Right. Yeah. Cool. And then we just need to make sure we plan. Yes. For that time schedule. Yes. Period. Absolutely. That solves most of it. Um, right. Before you continue, though, mm -hmm. if I could make one statement. Sure. I wasn't sure I totally agreed with this. And thank you for doing this, because I do think this is good. And it has, I mean, when meetings run an hour and a half long, you know, that, that becomes a serious problem. Um, but I think somewhere in here, 
that the agendas are being populated. And I, again, I've made this comment. I'll just say it for the record. You know, long meetings on Tuesday running an hour to an hour and a half over and 45 minutes on Thursday and we walk out the door. Mm. You know, that, you know, clearly there's some management there and I think we've talked about it, so. Yep. And, and again, I think, like you said, we'll, we'll focus on the, if we focus on the, um, uh, the proposed agendas, just keep in mind, thinking about two agendas. Right. Are we, have we overstacked Tuesday and we have understacked t Thursday, so. Gotcha. I concur. Um, work session items, I mean, I, I think that's pretty, all, I, all I'm asking is um, that we keep our questions more uh, policy related than, than um, you know, and a lot of times too, when we have workshops or informational items, we tend not to have an agenda review of them. I'm suggesting that maybe we need to, in order to, in order to reduce the, the amount of time that we're spending on asking questions that maybe aren't relevant to the decision we're trying to make. So um, again, I don't want to sty stymie anyone of what they're trying to accomplish, whether it's for themselves or the residents that are listening. I, I totally get that. It, it all includes myself. I need to think about what I'm going to ask too and why I'm asking it or does it need to be asked while I'm sitting here versus when I'm talking to Jorge or Jennifer or whomever. Um, and, you know, if I find that's going on, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to bring back the conversation to where it needs to be. Um, I've avoided doing that because I never want to seem disrespectful. As There's nothing more important to me than everybody having their... I mean, that's the sign of a good chair is, is if everybody has their say. And so I don't, I'm not trying to hinder that in any way. Um, I agree with that, though. You know, um, again, used to be on the staff side of this, and, you know, that, that was always, you know, that's the purpose for the pre-meetings, to try to get the smaller issues out of the way. I mean, you know, I mean, sometimes I ask a question out here, I know the answer. I'm just asking it. it. I'm asking it. because I think the public should know the answer too. But there's a lot of small things that can be taken care of behind the scenes, and 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 it's good. It's it's efficient. It's you know it's not that important that everybody in the world know. It's just things that we need to understand so we make a good decision. So I think that's a great you know just a reminder. Yeah. Um, and then the citizen input. <laughs> which is ironic because we've talked about it a couple of times. And listen, again, I am not trying to stop any of you from giving your opinion on something. You have every right to do that. I'm just looking for all the little ways that I can shrink time out of our meeting. You know, well, it, it, you know if I may add to that, Mayor, because there was a recent incident. We all probably will recall what it was. And I was very disturbed by it, and I yeah, did, I did inter intervene, and I'm not sorry that I intervened, but as I, um, I, I looked into some things after the fact, including people that were specifically named as examples, and found out there was more to the story. Um, so there is a reason it's good to, unless it's just really um, something just, yeah. just, we have to get it out, and I did, because I still have a concern with that issue but I understand the facts from the particular person may be a little different. So, but in general, it is good to make sure we're getting both sides. And the way to do that is, you know, take Hand the information, over. let staff look at it, and let them appropriately staff it so we're seeing the whole picture. So, okay. since I was a recent, you know, person, yeah. I thought I would give that example. Um, sorry. I are looking for your next note. Mayor, we try to make that clear too, and the notice is by this is the time to be heard, and being heard means the time that you all are are charged with listening, and sometimes people don't always feel not not that it matters necessarily at the feeling, but you know to allow people to to know that their responses are being listened to and then furthered forward rather than just an immediate response. Right. But I will say I 100% agree that when you give basic answers to basic questions that people ask. I would think it would be crazy land not to ans ask those, answer those questions yeah. right then. To me, it's rude. It is So rude, I totally agree with that process. You know, 
but we never did yeah. here. Right. And it always made me feel weird. Yeah. No, I, I think that keeping that piece of it is a good thing. Okay. Um, and then commission comments. Everything I've said here I think is all normal stuff, so um, I appreciate you hearing me out, and I'll do my best to try to keep these meetings running smooth. We've got four minutes. So uh, for whatever reason, I can't seem to find my agenda here. So um, I think it's city manager update, but go ahead. It is, Mayor, and I, I'd like to give you of that issue. I'm sorry, what? I'd like to give you an overview of that issue with sure. the dogs off, off leash. Mm -hmm. You have 10 seconds. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Just a joke. Eleven. I'll yeah. talk really fast. I'll <laughs> Just talk really kidding. Fast. I'm kidding. The, and, and in fact, this is a, a, an operational issue, and solely an operational issue. The the uh, gentleman has approached the commission twice. He's very passionate. I understand. And the issue is dogs. The certain hours that dogs are permitted off leash at Hammock Park. The and I'm going to read you a section of the code. Um, as it pertains to off leash hours, it's as an exception, and this is under the. Uh, animal control d definitions. It says, as an exception to the animal confinement restrictions, which is the, the, the leash law, in this section, the city manager may designate at his or her discretion designated animals to be unleashed or unrestrained on certain specified public property for the purpose of special events, unique occasions, or for other reasons deemed to be in the public interest by the city manager for such limited time periods as a city manager shall deem appropriate and as confirmed in writing. Now. I know that you have been approached and, and those approaching you are asking you to change the, the leash law hours. Uh, being an operational issue, and the, section, the, code of the, sec the section of the code I just read you, it is in the city manager's office to, to determine that, unless the city commission deems to amend the code itself. So that said, we, um, staff did convene. We had a very long meeting on this issue. Uh, we don't want to do any knee-jerk reactions. There are two sides to every story. There are those who are using that park, um, and they've been using it for many years, uh, and they've been doing it. They're not the bad actors, if you will. And so we need to listen to them as well. We need to arrive at a conclusion, I think, that will address the gentleman who uh, came to the city commission, as well as those who are, have the use and enjoyment of the park as is right now, meaning off-leash for certain hours of the day. Uh, we did, uh, on that, at that meeting, we had the sheriff's office, we had uh, our risk manager, Teresa Smalling, and members of Park Re Parks and Recreation staff. And we are arriving at what we feel are very good conclusions. Are they going to make everybody happy? Probably not. But we need to listen to all of those who have an interest in this issue and listen to them fairly. And we will, when, when that decision is made, Mayor and Commissioners, I will, I will submit it to you in writing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And appreciate the fact that I think we all do, that you're looking at all sides of, yes. of the issue. Absolutely. Um, and, and if I may, I don't know if you're, I mean, I, and I appreciate that you're listening to each side. just want to make sure we're listening to the professional side, animal people. I mean, I was with a veterinarian the other night, and they're like, what? I, we just need to understand if the basic premise of it makes sense, no matter how good some of the people are. Right. Does the premise and the liability that we're putting ourselves into, granted, nothing's happened, but... As our safety man knew, used to say, what hasn't happened in 10,000 years will happen tomorrow. Right. And it could be horrific. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're benchmarking. We're talking to professionals. Um, and and th th we need to reconvene the Hammock Advisory Committee as well and talk to them a little bit more in depth. So that's what we're doing. And, and, and again, I'm just going to say this for the record. I just, I just alluded to it. Both peoples whose names were brought up in Citizens Input last time, I spoke to them directly. And the story was completely different so mm -hmm. so that's the importance of listening yeah. to all sides making yeah. sure we have all the facts exactly. thank, thank you mayor uh, and besides that our written update is submitted on the published agenda for your review and that is an overview of the city operations for the month okay thank you thank you i skipped right over you over there girlfriend city yes. clerk <laughs> actually i just have a real quick one trying to keep us on time laura do you want to come up and so i can introduce um just because um she may be answering the phones or you'll have somebody new so if you want to take your mask off so they can see your face this is our new deputy city clerk wow this you is, really um, do look like Denise. <laughs> <laughs> like, never mind I'll just say that. this is laura and she she's been with us what three weeks now has it been um two and a half two and a half weeks and so she comes to us from oh gosh and you know i say it wrong each time 
Um, she was born and raised in Illinois, um, but uh, she, Eg, 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 Elgin. 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 <laughs> Elgin. <laughs> Elgin. I want to yeah, say no, the Elgin Police Department, just out. Um, up in Illinois, and so um, one of the things that really attracted, which you guys will like, um, is her records management skills, and her, um, so she's very versed in um, the Freedom Information Act and those sorts of things, so we're really excited to have her, and one of the quick, quick things that we found, um, what, you were just second day? Mm -hmm. um, we realized that we both served with uh, the same person in the U.S. Navy. Um, oh, wow. my, I, I actually cool. um, was in boot camp with the with her and then she served with her a little bit later because she's younger but um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was just kind of a small world right just right. in conversations because do you know lisa i'm like <laughs> yes i do i was that's really camp. cool <laughs> so anyway that was just a quick but um just you, um if you want to say anything but but just we're just really excited to have her oh, mm -hmm. thank you very much i'm excited to be here as well and i know i've met a few of you <laughs> okay, I know I've met you, um, and Jennifer, I've met you as well. So I didn't get to meet the rest of you personally, but hopefully within time I'll be able to do all of that. But well, thank you thank for having you for me. I appreciate the opportunity. You'll, you're going to love it, especially when we get in the new building. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, new building. <laughs> yeah, don't look, don't look at your office at this point. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't count. All right. But thank you. Thanks for joining us. Welcome. Glad Welcome. you're here. Thank you very Welcome. much. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks. Mayor, if we could uh, potentially violate your desire to, to shorten the meetings and Keith wanted to introduce uh, a new employee as well. <laughs> See, that should have been under city manager update. Yeah. I didn't tell her about it. Actually, <laughs> some of you have met Michelle Monteclaro already, so we stole Michelle from Pinellas County. Yay! Yeah. Yeah. We like that. Yeah. Jorge yeah, likes do. it too. Good almost, job, Jorge. almost thought we were going to have to get into a bidding war. Michelle worked in environmental management for uh, Kelly Levy. Oh, Kelly's mad at us now. So she was actually, what I did find out, she was a ghost writer for Kelly. All nice. the emails that we were getting for Red Tide. Oh, that was oh, Michelle. Awesome. Okay. Wow. So, but uh, very um, well educated. I'm not going to read the resume she's going to read the resume <laughs> so but uh um actually as far as storm order and picking up where our former employee left off um uh this girl has probably more way more knowledge of the storm order field than i could ever wish i could have okay. uh she's going to pick this up uh when it comes to code compliance Mm -hmm. She knows the word. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. Uh, she's, that's what she did mostly at Pinellas County. Uh, from, from the field all the way to the county attorney's office. Very good. Well versed. Uh, I'm going to let you take it from there. Mm -hmm. Michelle, um, I have extensive, an extensive background in water quality. Um, also, I enforced our stormwater ordinance, fertilizer ordinance, familiar with pond compliance as well. Um, I have extensive field background in terms of I monitored St. Joseph Sound, probably one of the most beautiful areas in this county, um, also as well as benthic sediment sampling. Um, so all the environmental science background, that's, that's all me. <laughs> um, so if you awesome. have any questions, please feel free to ask me. Um, Hope to get a lot of projects off the ground through grants, especially. Um, looking forward to that. Living shorelines, definitely, mm -hmm. if we can. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. Very cool. Wonderful. Great. Mm -hmm. I have a master's in um, environmental management. I studied the Great Barrier Reef. That was um, my area of concentration. It's management as well as, you know, we're looking at coral bleaching and, um, and really the communities living around the Great Barrier Reef. So I spent three years in Australia. Um, cool. Oh, cool. Studying, cool. studying that area. Yes. Very cool. All right. All right. Well, welcome to our city. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Congratulations. Yes. Very cool. Nice Thanks. Thanks, Keith. Good job, Keith. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Nikki, did you have anything? I don't have anything substantive, but I did want to let the commission know that I need to be traveling on Thursday evening, so I'll need to be attending virtually if that is acceptable. I know that you do have the second reading of the development agreement ordinance on your agenda. Yeah. Okay, that'd be great. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I'm going to, for me personally, under commission comments, uh, I'm just going to email you guys what my 
important things that I are, I've been holding for a couple of months, so I don't need to talk about them. Anybody else have comments? I, I have two real quick mm -hmm. because, again, I'm going to say Trashy Treasures is coming up. It's March 4th, $10 to get in and buy all these Trashy Treasures, DFAC. It goes on the next day with art supplies. It goes on the next day on Sunday for half off. And then the final day, it's like whatever you want to take, you take. And then second of all, real quick, I do want to congratulate John and Allison Freeborn, who were named patron of the arts by the Dunedin Fine Arts Center. And uh, their family has a long um, and storied um, background of, of working in the arts and it was very well deserved. If you see them, please uh, congratulate them. And last of all, the Foodways exhibit at the Dunedin History Museum begins at 5.30 this Friday. The Foodways exhibit. And that is it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, just really quickly, um, Tampa Bay Regional Planning, they've got their Resiliency Summit, uh, Resiliency Leadership Summit coming up on April 5th and 6th. Um, you know, I'd encourage any of us that could go to go, but it unfortunately is uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, which I think we have a commission meeting. So I will probably I will be in attendance. So I'll probably miss that Tuesday morning meeting. Uh, the future of the region awards are going to be awarded at the luncheon on the sixth. Um, they are work they are working out a way that those who who want to attend, depending on the awards, can come. Uh, obviously, just for the luncheon. Yeah, just for the luncheon, but it's going to be a problem. It's not going to be unlimited because depending on how busy the conference is, they can only let so many people in. But, you know, it, it's one, I think, we're putting it on COVID. You know, it was merged together as two events because yeah, we didn't event. even know that any who what was going to be able to happen. Uh, we had a lengthy discussion about it at yesterday's meeting. Everybody realizes the importance of future of the region awards. It'll probably be separated again next year so that the luncheon can stand alone. But in the meantime, since I'm convinced that we're going to win one big one, are we? Do we have our? Are we doing our uh, applications? We are. Okay. Yeah. What right. are Good. we doing? Uh, well, the region award and the and the. Oh, okay. I thought you said what we were doing. Yeah, no, no. no. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't have to. And the league yeah. and the league and the municipal achievement awards yeah. through the right. the spirit of the city is the one we're going for for the Gladys Douglas. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Spirit of the city. We won the spirit of the city once. Yes. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, we're gonna win again. <laughs> it was awesome. It was like a great. It was great. I, as a matter of fact, I'd rather win that one than almost any other one. Um, anyway, that was it. I just wanted to update everybody. So. Um, I would encourage whoever wants to come, depending on our awards, which I'm sure will be many. You know, it, it, we'll we'll figure out the way. They're, that's what they're trying I always to do, go. figure out the way. I thought we I thought we bought a table. We do, always. but it's not going to quite be like that. Be like that again. Um, right. Ren is going to figure out exactly what they're going to do now. What they've done is they want to encourage as many people as who want to come to be able to come. It's just going to be different. There won't be the tables because it's merged with the conference. So it's going to be a little different. So. They're asking everybody for patience on that. It'll be separated again next year, but in the meantime, we'll, we'll make do. So once we understand it better, I will make sure the commission knows. And whoever can come, I encourage you, you to try to come. You might want to say where it's going to be held. It's going to be at the uh, the place it typically is with the Carillon. Is it Carillon? Yeah. Yeah, yeah the Marriott. And it's the, no, yeah, not the Marriott. It's the, not I Hilton. I think it's Hilton. Hilton. Yeah. Yeah. It's Hilton, and um, so. Okay. And it's on the 6th. That's it. John, anything? I'm fine, thank you. Okay. We are adjourned. Cool. Only. Thank you for watching this City of Dunedin government meeting. If you'd like to review any part of this meeting or watch any previous government meeting coverage, you can watch these meetings online anytime through the city's website, DunedinGov.com. Stay connected with everything Dunedin. Follow the city on this channel and on the city's Facebook page, through Twitter, and on the city's YouTube channel. Thanks again for watching this Dunedin Television production.